if you don't appreciate mass immigration, then you're far right. We used to hold protests at Sharia courts, halal abattoirs. We used to invade. That's unacceptable in my book. You're going to get the Britain First treatment. Cockroaches running around everywhere. They're not nice places, prison. They're really disgusting. Despite all of their DNA being found on this girl, who's only 15, they all got bowed with no conditions. There was actually a terrorist duo that was plotting to chop my head off. Are you a racist? I always say to people, I'm far right and proud. Just a quick one. I want to thank our main sponsors, Bow Security. They're a UK-based security firm that cover the entertainment, industrial, corporate and construction industries. I'm going to leave the links to their Instagram and their website below in the description so you can contact them direct. You can also find my own social media platforms down there too. And if you've got this far and you haven't yet liked and subscribed to the channel, can I ask that you do so? It takes two seconds, costs nothing, and it helps us improve the experience for the guests and for those at home watching. Thanks again. Your support is greatly appreciated and I hope you enjoy this one. Paul, good to meet you finally. And you, thank you for coming on. If I was to go by what I've read on the BBC, in The Guardian, in fact, most of the mainstream media tabloids, yeah. you're leader of Britain first, the most dangerous far-right group in the country. And then I thought, that's interesting, because I'm interested in this label far-right. But what I've learned is, during this journey, don't believe what the mainstream say, and if I want to find out about somebody, it's nice that I've got a platform to reach out and say, hey, I'd love you to come on. I'd love to find out more about you because something doesn't add up. Yeah. I don't believe what the mainstream is saying. Come on down and let's have a chat. So let's go right back to the beginning of Paul Golding, where you're from, your family life, what was your upbringing like? And then we'll just roll right through your entire life and we'll cover Britain first, the political party, what inspired you. Everything that you want to cover, but I want to know about your life story. And that is about as much as I'm going to say during this interview, other than a few questions here and there, because now the spotlight's on you. Talk to me about the early stages of Paul Golding's life. Where are you from? Well, my family actually, uh, on the paternal side, father's side, um, come from southwest Wales, Pembrokeshire. My grandmother, great-grandmother, was the last recorded person to be born on Caldy Island, which is a very small island off the coast of Tenby in uh, Pembrokeshire. But during the Second World War, uh, my great-grandfather, Edward Golding, uh, was obviously enlisted. He joined the artillery uh, and he fought at the Battle of Dunkirk. Uh, he, was, he was a POW for five years because the, 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 he wasn't evacuated. He was left behind. Uh, and then 20 years later, my grandfather, who's now 92, he was a paratrooper, fought in the Suez War. Um, but the whole family, essentially, apart from our little connection to Pembrokeshire, my entire family are all South London, born and bred. And uh, my parents grew up in Camberwell and Brixton, in South London. When my mother and father got married and my mother fell pregnant with me, they thought, let's move out to the suburbs because mass immigration uh, and, and so on had made South London a pretty grim place to live. And what year would this been? This was early 80s. So I was born a couple, uh, right on the outskirts of London in Bexley Borough. Uh, I was born a couple of months before the Falklands War. Uh, and I mean, when I was growing up, it was just a typical suburban, working class, English upbringing. Uh, me and my friends used to go out. We used to play manhunt and ride our bikes everywhere and play curbsy and cricket and football and all this other stuff. Um, but then a few years later, it just completely changed, just like that. And then it was knives and hoodies and respect and all this crap, and it really did start going downhill. But I grew up in a pretty rough South East London council estate uh, called Slade Green, right on the outskirts, sandwiched in between Erith and Dartford. Mm. Uh, and I've uh, absolutely no complaints whatsoever about my upbringing. There was nothing particularly political. Um, what actually made me 
switch on the political uh, side of me. I think what activated it was, I think it was 1997, there was a general election. I think Tony Blair romped home to victory. And how old would you have been by 97? 14 years old, 15 years old, something like that. But I watched a broadcast on TV from the British National Party, the old BNP, and it was so powerful and so patriotic. Uh, and but the, but the BNP back then was a complete mess, but it was the only thing around. I mean, it was like when you got to the Conservatives, there was nothing further to the right of the Conservatives back then. It was the British National Party for, for well over a decade. That was the only thing that was there. And the BNP get very bad press. Now, I, believe it or not, I'm not actually that political. I've got my yeah. certain views that I stand by and I'll die by. But when it comes to the, the technical getting under the bonnet of politics, I'm pretty naive. So this is going to be really interesting for me. This is going to be an education. So yeah, just tell me about the BNP, why they've got such a bad name. The problem is humans look at things in kind of black and white, good, bad, you know, strong, weak. But it, it, if you look at things in kind of percentages, so the BNP was like, I would say, 95% decent, uh, working class, patriotic people. Yeah, but there was 5%, I would say, roughly about 5% of bad apples. And the media focused on that 5% and it gave the whole thing a, a toxic image. That's why they get such a hard time. But the reason they got such a toxic image, again, is because we never had social media. So back then, uh, the mainstream media was king. Uh, so I got involved in uh, nationalist politics 1999. I think I was 16, 17. Wow. Straight from secondary school. Watching the BNP broadcast had kind of triggered a, a chain reaction where I just became interested in, in political issues and what was happening in the country and w the direction it was going. So you latched onto it independently. Your mum and dad didn't steer you into no, politics? No. Wow. Just no, naturally inquisitive as a young man. If people are watching this, go, go type into YouTube uh, BNP election broadcast 1997. Uh, do, do the same yourself and you'll see how powerful that was. It really is a powerful election broadcast. They tried to ban it at the time. But that triggered off a chain reaction where I just became really kind of sucked in, mm. you know. Uh, when you find your real niche in life, it doesn't take much for you to just slip into that like a hand into a glove. It yeah. just happens naturally. Um, so at the age of 16, 17, one of the time, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was 1999. John Tyndall was leader of the party and he was like a an old 1970s NF type, like racial nationalist kind of thing. National Front NF. Yeah, kind of National Front type. Again, they had the, wor they had the worst name, didn't they? They did, yeah. But they, they were primarily around in the 70s and, and 80s. The, the, but the British National Party was the only thing that was around then. You know, if I could have joined something a bit more sensible, should we say, mm. less toxic. Sophisticated. I would have done, yeah. But that that's it. That, the, the only the only organisation between 1999 and maybe 2010 that was even remotely uh, interested in the issues of like the Great Replacement and mass immigration and anti-white racism, all these different things, was the BNP. And the media used to focus on them relentlessly, like uh, smears, demonisation, lies, just constant, boom, boom, boom. And that's how they got a toxic reputation because they didn't have social media to fight back like we do these days. Right. You know, you can see what the media is saying in one hand, but then you can look at social media and it, it, it counteracts it. Uh, and that's why, you know, Tommy's got a big following, Brisbane First has got a big following. I don't think we could have done this back in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s. You can't do any of this without social media which is why they were so, it got to about, what was it 2018? They started to really censor everyone, shut everyone down. Mm. You've been a victim of it yourself. Yes. Um, but going back to 1999, John Tyndall was the leader and he represented, you know, let's just do the, do the old thing, you know, let's stay the same, the old kind of national front type approach. Um, but Nick Griffin was a bit of a visionary. The, the thing with Nick Griffin is he's highly intelligent, but he's very daft. The, the fall was primarily due, due to him being daft and greedy to an extent. But, uh, That's another name that uh, will strike offence into the hearts of a lot of people. Mm. That's, a, that's a name that I remember. Ah, he's also had really bad press. Well, it, it, like when he went on Question Time, he wrecked his career. I mean, he was one, one in three of all adults in the whole of the United Kingdom were watching that Question Time, and he came across as a weak, unprepared, kind of weak character, and he just got trampled on. 
Yeah, there was a, a, a bounce of sympathy after question time. People felt sorry for him because it's just like a bear pit and he was getting savaged. Mm. But you could have dealt with that. He knew that was coming and he didn't prepare for it. And I remember at the time was pulling our hair out. He didn't do any simulation, any preparation. And then after that, the BNP support just nosedived. It just cut. And at the same time, the media was trying to contain the BNP success by artificially promoting UKIP so that all patriotic votes would go to UKIP and not the BNP. So those two things combined, plus Nick Griffin being elected to European Parliament, and he was just, he was absorbed and he he was uh, so enthusiastic for that champagne and caviar lifestyle in the European Parliament, giving his one-minute speeches and all that. He wasn't bothered about the, BF, the, the the party back in England. He wasn't bothered about, you know, running the running the party itself. He just wanted to be in the European Parliament, drawing his £200 a day attendance fee and all this, and just living the high life, really. So all of this came together in a perfect storm, and the rest is history. You know, the BNP doesn't even exist anymore. So how many years were you part of the BNP? But basically, uh, from 1999 to 2000 to late 2010, so it's just about 11 years. It's a big chunk of your life. Yeah, big chunk of my life. But there was big successes during that period. And what was BMP in your mind trying to achieve? Pre- pretty much, the, the the goals are the same as everyone else that exists at the moment. Wants to stop immigration. Wants to put British people first. Wants to uh, restore our patriotism, our sense of nationhood, our national pride, wants to eradicate crime, eradicate political correctness, just, you know, everything that everyone wants, really. Nothing you said there was remotely racist Mm. and or far right. The problem the BNP had was that occasionally there'd be a nutcase, an oddball, uh, and the media or Hope Not Hate or someone would dig up some kind of Nazi sympathies, a post or a, a secret video or something, and then that would be front page news. They'd link it. And it, it, that's what gave the BNP such a toxic image. And it's still got it. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, National Front, BNP. Mm. Immediately, you just, you just think neo-Nazi. Um, but that's, that's media programming. When I was there, 95% of the people in the BNP were just people like us, really concerned, worried, working class men and women who were patriotic, loved this country and wanted wanted to see a new political party that could uh, turn the situation around. That was the mission. Hmm. But like I say, Nick Griffin ballsed up on question time. He got stuck into the Europe, European Parliament, wasn't interested anymore. What was his balls up? On question time, look... It, it was the first time anyone like on the on the far right had been on something like Question Time. And we knew for a start the presenter is going to be hostile, the audience is going to be hostile, the panellists, the other guests are going to be hostile. So you're in there on your own. How do you deal with that? You have to go in there and be a tribune of the people, a man of the people, a bit like Trump. I don't give a shit what you lot think. I'm proud to be British. I'm going to spend my whole life fighting for the British people. And I actually gave him information on the other panellists. Like one of the other panellists, the Liberal Democrat, was Chris Hume. Chris Hume had been criticised shortly before question time for putting feather dusters on his parliamentary expenses. And he owns like four properties, five properties. And he's putting feather dusters on his parliamentary expenses and we're paying for them. I said, if he says anything to you, just throw that at at him. Mm. He's neutralised. He's finished. Everyone at home would be hating his guts. Didn't do it. He went in there completely unprepared. He thought he was just going to show off how intellectual and intelligent he was. It was going to be, it was an ambush. It was obvious what was going on. They're letting you on there so they can ambush you and make you look bad. And hopefully that contains the upward trajectory of the BNP victories at that time. Because breaking into the European Parliament, getting over 50 elected councillors, seat on the London Assembly, that's not insignificant. They were becoming a real force in British politics. How do we contain this? Let's make a complete fool of the leader. He should have known all this. He should have dealt with it. Mm. I said to him, let's do simulations. Let's get an audience. Let's get panellists. Let's put you put you there and let's, let's practice. Practice, practice, practice. No, wasn't interested. Over in the European Parliament, drawing his 200 quid a day. and uh, Was he a racist? Depends what you mean by a racist. Did he object to people of different races? Well, no, no. What he did, he inherited a party 
that had a whites only membership criteria. But then he changed the constitution to allow uh, people of ethnic minorities to join the BNP. I remember travelling to Wellingborough in the Midlands to meet Rajinda Singh, who was an elderly Indian uh, Sikh. And I remember going to meet him at the, uh, and picked him up, took him to the BNP's office in the Midlands, and we got some photos done with his membership, his BNP membership card, and he was the first kind of ethnic minority member of the BNP. But that's primarily because he, he inherited the, you know, a much more hardline party and then transformed it into something far more modern and moderate and more mainstream. And it worked because the, the electoral success is undeniable. So during your stint in the BNP, behind the scenes in your in your private life, mm. what were you doing? Was you involved in any sporting activities, nightclubbing? Oh, Completely yeah. non-political. Like who, who was Paul Gold in, in his private time? I've always liked a real, you know, crazy night out up until five years ago. I haven't drank alcohol or touched anything for five years now. I haven't been out at all. Been just completely dedicated to the, to this struggle. Um, but yeah, I, I, I used to go on boys' holidays. I used to go out for every Friday and Saturday night. I used to go on the razzle. I'll admit it. I used to get in fights. I used to go out and it was, it was a lot of times it was, it was chaos. And, um, but growing up in a rough area of South East London, you know, uh, we used to have, I've probably had hundreds of street fights, hundreds. Uh, we used to arrange fights. We used to have fights with different, different, you know, gangs from different areas, not gangs, but, you know, groups from different areas. Um, and nightclubs as well always used to end up. I mean, who hasn't? Who hasn't actually been there? Oh, who well, hasn't actually been to a nightclub, got totally smashed, ended up having a fight? And Well, that's the thing. We all have, but everyone likes to paint a squeaky clean picture. And I think that when you reveal that you're just, you're just the same as anybody else, I grew up the same as anybody else, I went out, done the same things, I got in the yeah. same scrapes, it completely humanises you and people look at you from a complete different perspective and think, ah, okay, let's find out more about the person rather than the, mm. the, than the political views. And then they get a better understanding of why they're the views and that's the road that you've taken. So you're a working class guy, yeah. Living in Erith, I can vouch, it's a rough area. We used to yeah. do a door there where the capacity was 80 and they asked for four doormen and the, the venue was split in half, two gangs, and we're just waiting for it to go off. So I know Erith is rough. Mm -hmm. So you've grown up, so yeah, not leafy, suburban, no troubles, you don't see any crime or influx of migrants. I mean, people like me and Tommy Robertson, we're working class lads. Mm. We're pretty, almost the same age, but we, we yeah, we've got a really, we've had a really colourful life. Mm. I used to train MMA, boxing, Thai boxing, uh, where, you know, we used to go on boys' holidays. We used to be we out clubbing all the time, always out partying, just just living life, really. And you've had bouts as well, haven't you? I had bouts, yeah. Yeah, so there's one thing just going to the, the gym once a week, but you actually competed and fought. In, in amateur MMA, I got to, I think it was, I was ranked fourth in, the, in, the, in my weight division in the whole country. Um, but the problem is I was plagued by a lot of injuries. A lot of injuries. I had a broken hand. You could probably see the see the ridge there. Mm -hmm. I had a broken hand, a broken nose. You can probably see it's a little bit off centre. Um, two broken arms with plates in the arm uh, from tie boxing. You know, blocking shins yeah. and so on. So I was I was I was always injured all the bloody time. But yeah, I wonder how many people know that about you, because most mostly you're seen speaking very nicely in a suit, and to think of someone. Speaking well, fighting for the country in a suit. It's hard to imagine them in a cage, which takes balls of steel, and that is a good indication that you, you've always had the fighter in there. Yeah, I used to train at some of the best gyms in London. I used to train with some of the best fighters in London. I used to train with a guy called uh, Lightning Lee Murray. You might have heard that name. He was the the, the mastermind allegedly behind mm. the Tunbridge heist, the Tunbridge Securitas Depot heist, the That's largest right. cash robbery of all time. Uh, I used to train with him. Uh, for a while, I used to try. I used to train MMA, boxing, Thai boxing. I used to do it every single day. I loved it. So yeah, I mean, my only sporting endeavours. I, I even to this day, I absolutely hate football, hate rugby, hate tennis, hate cricket, hate the bloody lot of them. People say, "Oh, what do you like then?" I say, "Boxing, uh, Thai boxing, MMA, you know, UFC, all things combat." All things combat, yeah, because that's what I used to do and that's what I used to be, be really interested in. That's what I've been... I still train now. Mm. I still do uh, boxing or tyre boxing three times a week. Well, you've got to, really. 
well, you've got to stay. You've got to stay in relative shape, haven't you? Yeah. You need to be able to protect yourself, didn't you? Mm. Yeah. You never know who's going to pounce on you in the street that have a difference of opinion. Well, I like to um, when I haven't got security around me at mm. events or activities. I like to just you know knock about without being recognised. I always wear a little bit of a disguise. I say a disguise like baseball caps and hoodies and stuff like that. People don't recognise me. Glasses with false nose and moustache. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go that far. But no, even a simple baseball cap mm. just completely takes the edge off the recognition. Do you get approached a lot when you're out on the street? When the baseball cap is off, yes. And what kind of reception do you get? Nine out of ten times, extremely supportive. Uh, but I always keep in mind, and I try to try to keep sharp at all times, because I know this is serious. There's a difference between being brave and courageous and being reckless. Mm. I'm not going to be reckless. No, I won't back down from anything. Um, I won't... Uh, you know, I won't, uh, I won't cower down. I won't surrender. I won't anything like that. I've never done it, and you can see all the stuff we've been up to over the years. You can see that we've never, ever, backed down from anything. We've well, been in some hostile situations. I've seen that that, that have been caught on mm. camera. Yeah, have you been uh, fully full blown attacked? Oh, many times. Yeah, I was attacked uh, about about three months ago. I was attacked in Manchester. What happened there? It, it didn't really. Let, it fizzled out very quickly. But yeah, we get it all the time. I, I find, to be honest, and I, you know, I'm not shrinking violet, but you do get it quite regularly. Get approached for every person that shows you support, uh, there'll be someone equally who doesn't like you. And I always tell myself that if someone's recognised you in a positive way, there'll be someone who's recognised you in a negative way. And I find that most of the time, I find that if if you stand your ground and get serious, it diffuses the situation. You know, someone who's grown up in a middle-class background, someone like Nick Griffin. Nick Griffin was very brave, but physically completely inept. Mm. Um, he, he always needed security. You know, people like me and Tommy, can we don't, we don't need security. We can handle ourselves. But most of the time we're out in activities and stuff, we have security because you might be dealing with a gang, a horde, a crowd. Have you ever been badly hurt by an attack? Only in prison, Yeah. Well, I tell you what, let's bring it back to the demise of the BMP, that chapter there, because then prison come after that, didn't it? Yeah, oh yeah. Late 2010, I resigned from the BMP because I could see the way it was going. I was, wasn't interested. On what grounds did you do that? Uh, it's quite a long time ago. But if I remember, the, the letter that I sent to Nick Griffin resigning was basically, I'm appalled by your indulgence of the EU Parliament gravy train. You should be back in this country, um, you know, leading the party on home soil, not just spending all your bloody time over there preparing your one-minute speeches and have, going having your lunches with other members of parliament and all that. But I think it was mainly that and the, the fortunes of the party were declining very quickly, especially, and I could see it all derived, a lot of it from um, his performance on Question Time, the EU parliament nonsense, um, and also the fact that the media were really promoting UKIP at that point. They were doing it deliberately. But yeah, rewind back to then. I resigned. I spent about maybe, I think it was just under a year, but roughly about a year just relaxing. Uh, I'd, I'd had children by then, so I'd kind of just spe spent a year out. Because uh, when you're in the trenches like we are, I, I mean, I sympathise with Tommy, he sympathises with me. When you're and Ashley as well, and, and anyone who's at the top level of doing what we're doing, it's 24-7. Especially if you get noticed, you get recognised, you can't relax, you've got to watch over your shoulder all the time. It's just pressure, 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 pressure. There's no money on our side of the fence, no big donors, no big backers. It's all grassroots, finance, uh, donations and so on. So you're always struggling to make ends meet. You're always under pressure. There's always stressful situations. Uh, you're always being arrested. You're always being sued. You're always doing this, that and the other. Um, so eventually, you know, when you get a chance, you can take a rest. Hmm. So I did. I took like a year out and I just sat back and just watched. But I was part of a network of other people who'd resigned from the BNP as well, regional organisers, former party staff and all that. We was all in talking and so on. Um, and then about a year later, we thought, oh, you know, we could see where things are going. And we thought, you know what, we need to launch something new. We need to launch something fresh to essentially replace the old BMP and and to replicate all the millions of votes that it got. Because I think it was in 2009, it got 2 million votes. 
That's, that's a lot. Mm. You wouldn't have thought the BNP got 2 million votes. They say a lot like in 2015, Farage got 4 million votes for UKIP. Well, the BNP got 2 million votes. So, you know, it done very well. It was a very successful party. So we, but it, we could see it was all crashing and burning around us. Let's launch something new. But this time, let's not make the mistakes that they made, that, that always used to anger us, that always used to agitate us. Let's do things properly this time. And at the, at the same time, 2009, the EDL took off under Tommy Robinson. And that was, to me, that was equally as appalling, although it highlighted things massively. But it was, you know, the, the drunken hooligan behaviour. Because essentially that movement was the football firms. So I've never liked that sort of behaviour. That's why you don't see me organising big demos or going to many big demos. Because I can't stand watching people walk around in public, you know, shouting and with a can of Stella in their hand. Get pissed afterwards, yeah? Get smashed afterwards. But while you're out there in public, you're an ambassador for the cause. Behave like a gentleman, you're saying. Behave like a gentleman, yeah. So we launched Britain first and we thought we're not going to replicate, we're not going to tolerate or replicate the hooligan behaviour of the EDL and we're not going to tolerate the bad apples that brought the BNP down. So from 2011 till I think it was early, early, early 2014, that's that I call those the wilderness years because they were a real struggle. Mm. We had no supporters, we had no members, we had no donors, we were... We were, we were non-existent. And was it your full-time job? Fully invested? Yeah, fully invested in it. Um, but yeah, say full-time job without a wage. <laughs> How did you survive then? Oh, crumbs. Literally crumbs. Yeah. For years, it was really, really difficult. Really, really hard. Stressful? Really stressful, yeah. When Lee Rigby got murdered just before that, I think that was like May 2013. So I had a real difficult existence up till then. And then I moved back from Northern Ireland, where I was living, where we launched Britain first. And I moved back to where I come from, South East London. And I, I went to work with my father on the lorries, and I got a little bit of money. So, I was, you know, is it, life improved slightly. Uh, and then what happened, it was like, you know, like the spark, and then the rocket took off. So Lee Rigby was killed. And then I think it was like... Towards the end of that year, so it's like December 2013, something like that, I found out on Facebook or something like that that Anjem Chowdhury, you know, the radical hate preacher, mm. um, was going to be holding a little protest march up Brick Lane. He was protesting against alcohol being sold on Brick Lane, you know, because obviously Muslims don't drink alcohol uh, or they're against it ideologically. So I thought, I'm going to go up there and see what happens. So I went up there with a friend who did a bit of filming for me. And uh, when he's little, there's only about 20 of them to be fair, but when they got to the corner of uh, Whitechapel Road and Brick Lane, when they got to that corner, I grabbed a flag and just stood in front of them, blocked their path. And then there was a face off for like an hour. The police were asking us to move. We told them to sod off. And they were waiting patiently for us to move. But there was me and there was, a, there was a couple of others from other groups that had come along. But primarily it was me at the front like this with a flag. Was like, You're not coming past. We're blocking your little march. And then after about an hour, the police begged me to move. Mm. So that Chowdhury, they were was, was quite patient to be honest, but Chowdhury, they was hurling insults and we was hurling them back. But then Chowdhury wanted to carry on his little protest up, march up Brick Lane. Um, but after about an hour, I said, yeah, all right, I'll go now. So I put put the flag away, and I, what I did, I walked walked down the side of this protest until I could see Anjem Chowdhury, who's maybe about eight foot away, and I pointed my finger at him. I said, I know where you live, Chowdhury, I'll be coming to see you. And then I, I backed off. And uh, footage of this went viral all over, all over social media. This was the start, the real start of Britain First, that day on that corner. Because we're now talking a fair bit about Anjem Chowdhury, there's going to be people that don't know who he is. Can you just, in a nutshell, describe who Anjem Chowdhury is? Yeah, Anjem Chowdhury, we focused on him. Anjem Chowdhury is, well, he was, like the main spokesman for Islamic extremism in Britain. He's connected to dozens and dozens and dozens of terror plots all around the country. It got to the point, actually, because he was always left alone. He was never, you know, if, if everyone around me in Britain first was plotting terror attacks, 
very quickly I'd be implicated and, and they, they would prescribe Britain first. They would ban it, and rightly so. But he never got uh, he never got charged or prosecuted for anything. And he, in the end, we almost thought that he was a bit of a an informer or a bit, bit of a grass because He's... everyone around him was getting arrested. Mm. Well, uh, so, some of the things I used to hear Anjem Chowdhury say in public that's that's out there in the public domain for people to see and hear for for, their, for themselves, I could not believe it was allowed and he wasn't just yeah. taken off the streets, arrested immediately straight into court. It was outrageous. I, I can't remember what they call it in the like intelligence or law enforcement circles, but he's like a candle. So he's the he's the candle, and then all the terrorist moths all come to the candle, and then like, obviously he then grasses them up, and they'll get put in prison. So that's the theory. That's the theory, and I'll stand to that to this day. So I, I reckon it was quite an operation. I wouldn't be surprised because what I was seeing, what he was getting away with, was excitement. It was shocking you know, to the core. It was shocking to the core. Yeah. He, he was inciting violence, hatred, mm. everything. It was like, wow, how is this man allowed to preach that on the streets of London? Yeah. So that day, uh, when I blocked Anjem Chowdhury's march, only for an hour, but the footage of me threatening him and doing it went viral all over social media, got millions and millions of views, and, and the comments were just vast. And, and positive as well, like, oh, brilliant, this this guy is brilliant, well done, we need more of this, we need more people like him, blah, blah, blah. Because they were running amok at that time. You know, there's the Muslim patrols in East London, there was terror attacks all the time, it was crazy. So I thought, you know what, this is what we need to do. We need to become a slick and professional opposition group to Islamic extremism. And then we need to put those videos onto social media so the British people support us and also, they know what's going on in this country. So it was like, on the one hand, we were trying to uh, illuminate and shine a spotlight on what the, all these Islamic radicals were doing around the country. Uh, and at the, uh, at the same time, we were trying to strangle their activities. So from that point on, I think it was like a month after that, there was a, an EDL branch in Kent that said that we absolutely loved what you did at Brick Lane. We loved it. Let's have a meet up. So I thought, yeah, I'll go along and meet meet up. So we met up at a pub in Dartford, and they said, "Look, we just we just we're fed up of going on march after march after march, protest, protest, protest. This city, that city, we're fed up of it. It's not doing anything. We want to get stuck in like you did." So I said, "Right, well, let's do it. Let's get stuck in, but let's be professional about it." And I like we all come to an agreement that we would be very disciplined and very kind of professional with our approach. We wouldn't be just a bunch of yahoos, you know, turning up at someone's house. Uh, it would be intelligence-led, and then we would go and uh, confront or uh, expose and so on. So shortly after that, uh, we started identifying targets. that We, we used mil military language, but generally, you know, it, it worked. Uh, it worked, worked pretty well. We started identifying people like... Abu Izzadeen, Anjem Chowdhury, Abdullah Dean, Abdul Mahid, basically anyone who is a known Islamic extremist. We were constantly working. Where do they live? What mosque do they go to? Where do they work? And then we, if we found out anything at all, we would do surveillance. We wouldn't just you know, barge in, run in. We'd, we'd, we'd make sure that they lived at this address or that they worked here. And so... Britain first started to take off like a rocket, especially on Facebook. We went from like, you know, tottering around at a few thousand followers. After the, the confrontation at the bottom of Brick Lane with Anjim Chowdhury, we bang, we was up like 50,000 50, followers very quickly. And then with every new uh, high octane, entertaining video that we would put out of us confronting these Islamic extremists, the, the, the support would just go bang, 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 bang until when we got closed down in March 2018, we had 2.2 million followers on Facebook, which was more than, at that point, more than all the other political parties of the mainstream combined. And we was reaching something like 10, 15 million people organically in this country every week. So it's about roughly the same size as the BBC in terms of reach. Uh, but yeah, we for, for the first few years, we just found out where these people lived, we monitored their Twitters, their Facebooks, we, we monitored their meetings, and we just focused exclusively 
on opposing and confronting some real dangerous terrorists in Gen- this country. Genuine radicals. Genuine radicals. You know, Anjem Chowdhury might be a bit of a clown, mm. but the people around him are hardened terrorists or mm. terrorist wannabes. You know, they're ready to die. They're, they're really dangerous people. So we would find out where, we found out where Abu Izzedin lived. One of our supporters in Kent, luckily, had a decommissioned British Army Land Rover. And we thought, we'll have that. Uh, and we used to go. So a typical Monday to Friday would be intelligence gathering and surveillance. I'd work out what we was going to do. Friday, 7 p.m., we'd meet in the, in the pub in Darford. We'd have the, uh, the, the Army Land Rover, which was like impenetrable. You can't get into those. Uh, and then everyone would turn up at the pub. And I'd say, right, yeah, we've got two operations this evening. And you're not finding out what they are until the very last minute. So no one could snitch, no one could leak. Information was kept very, very uh, strict, very, very confidential. Only I knew what was going on. So literally, I wouldn't inform anyone of what we were doing. And it worked because we never had any leaks, we never had any ambushes, nothing at all. So we would meet up, I would say, let's go, got operations. We'd jump inside the Army Land Rovers. We'd turn up, for example, Abu Izzedine's house. We'd turn up at his house would go and knock his door. You imagine he's got 20 men on his doorstep and I'm screaming through a megaphone, come out, you coward and face us. You think you're a, you're a convicted terrorist? You think you're a big bad jihadi? Come out and face us. And we'd go and speak to all the neighbours and so on. We really put them under a lot of personal pressure. And this is all around the time that there was that flurry of terror attacks. What really sparked my anger was Lee Rigby. Mm. Because I grew up just down the road. That was harrowing. Yeah. So Woolwich, as you know, Woolwich, just you can drive down the uh, dual carriageway to Erif in what, 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, not too far. Very from close either, together. Uh, so when that happened, I was up there the next day and I could see it was all cordoned off, forensic things everywhere. But yeah, that really did upset me uh, deeply because it was almost on my doorstep. Mm. You know, and I, just across the road is Woolwich Swimming Baths, where I used to go all the time when I was young. So it was very much you know, on my doorstep. And I thought, something's got to be done about this. So Anjem Chowdhury and his his crew, his network at that time, I think there may have been 20 to 30 of his main people. So they almost every week he would be protesting somewhere in London because they're all on benefits. None of them work. They're all benefit scroungers. Or as Anjem Chowdhury calls it, jihad seekers allowance. Uh, so there's about 20 to 30 of them. They were protesting every single week. Everywhere they went, we was on the opposite side of the road counter-protesting. And then at some point of the day, right towards the end, we would set up, I would set up a signal. I'd say, get get ready, everyone, get ready. And then all of a sudden, 20 of us would just go bang and we would charge across the road. The police would be trying like this, trying to stop this this flood of, of, of patriots running across the road. And we just charged their demos. And we'd be face to face with them, and the, the police would be rugby tackling us and all that. Um, but yeah, we used to get stuck into them. Like we we weren't shrinking violets back then. We used to get stuck right into them. And I was arrested all the time, put on bail conditions. That seems fair game to me. I think I would want to put a blanket over that fire. It's like we cannot have radicalism spreading any further than yeah. it. Well, it just doesn't need to spread anywhere. Yeah. So that would. That would shock a lot of people to think that you, you're, you're trying to put a stop to radical organisations to spread that further and wider, but yet you're being arrested by British yep. police. That two-tier policing goes all the way back, mm. and we had it back then. For example, we went all the way to Leighton in North East London, all the way to Leighton, parked up in a car park, and then everyone jumped out and I said, right, this is what we're doing, right? We're here now. This is what we're doing. Round that corner is Bromley Road. Number one, Bromley Road, is where Anjem Chowdhury lives. Yeah? So we're going to go round there and protest on his front doorstep and knock his door. Uh, so we all bowled round there, 20, 30 of us, and held a protest outside his house. But it quickly became apparent that he wasn't in because it was very, it was all, you know, no lights on. It was just like desolate. So... Uh, we, we stayed there for about 20 minutes and I thought, oh, this might backfire because it's he's not in. And then all of a sudden I heard a big commotion and loads of loads of like shouting 
And I looked, and at the end of the road, there was a little car, a little purpley kind of Toyota Prius or something like that, turning in and stopped. And then it was slowly reversing out. And then I heard someone say, that's him, that's him, that's him. And I couldn't control everyone. Literally, 20, 20, 30 lads just steamed for this car. And it was Anjim Chowdhury with his family in that car. And there was there was, there was was my activist hanging off his bonnet and trying to block his car and everything. That was brilliant because he got the shock of his bloody life that night. Mm. He'd been involved or connected to terror attack after terror attack after terror attack, plot after plot after plot. He's always out there inciting. He was the one who radicalised the Killers League rugby. And he's just had... For the first time ever, a bunch of Englishmen hanging over, or hanging off of his bonnet as he's desperately trying to run away. So that's the kind of a classic activity of what we did during that period. Um, and again, the video for that went viral. And then a couple of days later, uh, I get swooped upon by the Met Police, arrested, uh, bailed with no charge. And they put bail conditions. I'm not allowed to enter London, not allowed to enter Greater London. But yeah, we so we went to their houses, we went to their workplaces, we went to their protests. Any time they showed their face in public, they had us to deal with. But yeah, it, it was brilliant. And all the videos of this, people just loved it. People loved to see it. And we used to... Do you remember the Muslim patrols? Where they used to... This particular... Anjem Chowdhury and his crew used to go around East London, but particularly the areas surrounding Brick Lane. And they used to harass people. He used to go up to women and say, why are you dressed like that? There's a mosque over there. Go and dress properly. Mm. Go up to someone holding a beer. Beer's haram. You shouldn't be holding that. And they go up to someone, oh, you're gay, are you? Yeah, I'm gay. You shouldn't be around here. All this kind of stuff. And the Muslim patrols. I'm quite surprised you don't remember them. No, I do remember them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah I do. I'm just, I just want to hear it from, yeah. from, from you, yeah. So we thought, mm. And also I'm thinking in stereo. So as you're saying it, I, I'm picturing those patrols. Yeah. And I remember Anjem Chowdhury word for word saying, Pretty much what you've just said, yeah. and and I, I still, even to this day, it, it, I'm in disbelief. It was his, he's one of his lieutenants called Abdul Mahid that used to organise them. We found out where he lived as well. We used to confront him all the time, and then we got these cr- Christian patrol leaflets. So they did the Muslim patrol, we did the Christian patrol. So we got a leaflet with like a Templar cross on it, and said, you know, uh, we're not here to cause trouble. We're actually here if if you are harassed by any of, of these Muslim patrols, just ring this number, and let us know. So it's more of you know. It was a Christian patrol, but it wasn't like, you know, uh, a hostile thing to mm. the people in that area. The Muslim patrols were hostile. They were they were harassing people. The people that you would target, the these radicals, eventually, or after that you targeted them for different reasons, did any of those ever get prosecuted and sent to jail for crimes? All of them. Okay, so this is this is a this is with a, one exception, a ginger convert called Abdullah Dean. Okay, well, it's very important that that's made clear because, again, just to highlight, you weren't targeting people that weren't a threat. You was actually finding direct, dangerous individuals and you was targeting them. And since then, they've all been prosecuted and jailed since. They're all in jail. Even Andrew Chowdhury is still in jail at the moment. Um, So uh, what we did was our plan, really, after Lee Rigby, we said the only way this can happen again is if we suffocate them. We suffocate their activities, confront, uh, turn up, confront and expose them with the social media videos. And it, in my opinion, it worked to a degree because so many tens of millions of people got to see these Islamic extremists with their UK police go to hell banners and they're screaming for the UK to go to hell, uh, saying that, you know, Buckingham Palace will be a mosque, all this kind of stuff. Um they, people got a glimpse of that through the mainstream media, a glimpse. But what we did made it international, made mm. it viral. And everyone could see, wow, these these fuckers are out every week, all the time. Look at Britain First out there opposing them all the time. But they're, they're, these bastards are allowed to say, do what they're doing and say what they say uh, without any repercussions at all. And it's only Britain First doing doing the job that the police should be doing. In the end... Their, their activities just absolutely ceased and we ran out of things to do. I mean, it just, it just that this one got sent to prison, this one got sent to prison, this one got sent to prison, and then it just all fizzled out. Did the police ever use any of your intelligence to prosecute these guys? Uh, that I don't know. But I believe that our shining that spotlight on this radical network 
really did force the hand of the police. I think that, you know, with, with this much pol- uh, public exposure on this network, we've got to do something. We can't just, we, we can't be seen to, to be letting them run riot, especially after like Lee Rigby and all that. And the other thing as well, Britain First is getting too strong, getting too popular. I mean, very quickly, we was up to like a million followers on, fa- on Facebook, very quickly. And all of our videos were going viral. And I think this forced the state. The, the state was quite happy just to ignore them, you know, two-tier policing, just let them do what they're doing. Um, but I think that spotlight on Anjim Chowdhury and his network, I, I think it forced the authorities to, to start clamping down on them. Uh, but, but, but one by one, they were all sent to prison, including Chowdhury himself. Got a long sentence. He's back in jail now. Uh, and it fizzled out. We, we ended up running out of things to do. The whole network that we used to lock horns with had been com- effectively neutralised. Uh, I think we had, we must have had some bearing on that. that it, we can argue all day to what extent, but our activities, even if it's just bringing it to the public's attention with the viral videos, it all had an effect. And eventually, one by one, they were all scooped up and put put in jail for terrorism, plots, incitement, one or the other. And it all fizzled, completely fizzled out. Uh, and then we we kind of, we had to pivot after a while to do something else. And that's when we started doing street activities, protests, demonstrations. We used to hold protests at Sharia courts, um, halal abattoirs. We used to invade. We used to do all sorts of, you know, crazy stuff. My first prison sentence, this was a classic activity, actually. It, it, it blew up all over the news, all over the mainstream media that an imam at an extremist mosque in Cardiff in Wales had been caught on audio recording, basically telling the Muslim worshippers it's okay to keep sex slaves as long as they're non-Muslim because the Prophet Muhammad did it. Bang. Big media frenzy, big media, uh, you know, big media bonanza around this whole issue. We thought, right, let's go down there and let's get get stuck in. So I took a team down to that mosque um, and... Uh, shortly before that, I'd been given an injunction by the High Court, which I didn't fight against. I did. I just let them get on with it. I let them get on with it um, because it was just too expen- ruinously expensive to try and fight against. It would have cost like a hundred grand to try and fight against it, and we could have lost anyway. So I just thought, just let them get on with it. We agreed to this, and it basically banned me from every mosque in England, and Wales, going into the mosque, into the grounds. Um, but I thought this is too much, you know, a, a Muslim imam saying it's all right for Muslims to keep sex slaves. That could have some kind of consequences if any of those worshippers go and kidnap a young girl or rape a young girl or do something terrible uh, to anyone. So I thought we need to go down there and confront him, even though I've got this injunction hanging over my head. So we went down there. I actually stayed outside the mosque. I actually stayed at the front door. It was my activist that went in there and said, where's the imam? Where's this guy? I can't remember what his name was. Where is he? We want to see him. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but because of all the media publicity, he'd fled, he'd gone into hiding. Uh, so we came away and then I was on, I was in Luton, uh, magistrates on trial for something else. We went to Berry Park in Luton, Tommy stomping ground. Mm. We went down there, giving out leaflets and uh, and stuff with flags and that uh, down Berry Park High Street and then back. PR. Yeah, as an activity. And uh, it almost kicked off, almost a, a riot almost ensued. And then Bedfordshire police came down us like a ton of bricks. So I was in uh, the magistrate's court at Luton and the police come up to me and handed me, said, Mr. Golding, you've been served. And they handed me a big, uh, like, folder full of legal documents. And it was relating to the activity we did in Cardiff. So I got summoned to the high court. They said, you breached your high court injunction. You sent people into that mosque. I said, no, I never. I waited outside. And they was like, yeah, but you're not allowed to send people in there. I said, well, yeah, whatever. I said, okay, you can have four weeks in prison as a, as a punishment. Uh, and I remember being in the court, and they, you know, they, they, when you get sent to prison, they come in from the back, the guards, mm. to escort you. So they came in the back. My solicitor said, where's he going? And they said, oh, he's going to Pentonville. And my solicitor looked at me and said, fuck, that's a, that's a real rough prison. That's a right dump. And uh, I'd never been to prison before, so that's quite nerve-wracking. And how old were you then? Oh, God, I can't remember. This was in 2016. You know, so so that, that's quite old for your first stint in jail. Yeah, that was my first time in prison. Um, but even to this day, you know, I would have done that 100 times over because that imam 
was caught red-handed telling his worshippers it's all right to keep sex slaves because the Prophet Muhammad did it. Yeah, that's unacceptable in my book. You're going to get the Britain First treatment. So <laughs> I, got, <laughs> I got sent to prison. The BFT. Yeah. <laughs> got sent to, I got, only got, mercifully, I only got sentenced to four weeks. So I got uh, put in the transport, got taken to Pentonville, didn't know what was coming. I had no idea. I was told by my solicitor to tell them when you got there that I was a um, a vulnerable prisoner. Just keep telling them you're a vulnerable prisoner, that you will get attacked and it will be, you know, chaos and all that. Um, but when I got there, I didn't need to because they said you're going into isolation on the detox wing. Uh, so what they did was they the detox wing is always half empty. They put me in a cell in the corner and I was basically on 24-hour bang-up for four weeks. And how did that affect your mind? Well, it's my first time in prison. People say, oh, four weeks, I can do that. But trust me, when you're in isolation, mm. it's incredibly difficult. No laptop, no mobile phone, nothing. Just a, a tiny little TV about that big that's about 10 foot away from you. Uh, horrible, stiff bed, disgusting toilet, rank, rank rancid cell, you know, Pentonville's like 170 years old. I don't think they've improved it at all in that time. Cockroaches running around everywhere. They're not nice places, prison. They're really disgusting. My first time, four weeks, what really got to me was the grinding boredom. Even if it was just four weeks, it was the grinding boredom. The first five days, I just tried sleeping. Mm. And I slept. God, I, I, was, I, I slept from like... I don't know, uh, 12 midnight to like 2 p.m. in the afternoon the next day for like five days solid. But then my body must have adjusted and become well-rested. And I started to sleep less and less. Mm. So then you'd get up at like 8, 9 in the morning. And then you just try and pass the time until 12 midnight. And it's just boring. You're always looking at the clock and, oh, God, it's only been 45 minutes. It's just grinding boredom. And it just feels never-ending. Tommy's, I've spoken to Tommy, I'm good friends with Tommy Robinson, and he, he said the same thing. The isolation, even with short sentences, it really does put pressure on you psychologically. When I came out, when I was released, and someone handed me my phone, and I turned it on, and the, with the screen and everything, turned on, I, I was almost vomiting, because it was so, it was like sensory overload. Right. But yeah, I mean, it was only, mercifully, it was only four weeks, but it felt like four years. You mentioned um, that you and Tom Robinson are good friends. Did you and Tommy ever clash or not get on? Uh, we didn't like each other, no. We were, we were rivals, we could say. And then, but yet you were both on the same mission or a very, very similar one. Yeah, he was, um, he, was with the, like, he was the leader of the EDL and then he quit that and then he went to prison. When he came out of prison, I remember meeting up with him a few times and then I was friends with Jim Dowson at the time and... We all met up at this pub in Bedfordshire, had a good old chat, and then uh, came away. And Jim Dowson basically was working with Hope Not Hate at that point, and he, he engineered this big... He, he came away and basically went to Hope Not Hate and said that, oh, Tommy wants to start a race war, him and Amory Walters and all They want to start a race war. Um, and he was saying, don't... You need to cut off all contact with Tommy Robinson now. They're planning to do some real stupid things. You're going to get in trouble, all this. And I was like, because I was friends with Jim at the time and not friends with Tommy, I was like, all right, I'll just block him, whatever. Um, turns out, years later, it was all complete nonsense and it was just a hope, not hate thing. And what is hope, not hate? Hope, not hate is the UK's leading uh, communist, far-left extremist, dirty tricks operation. They essentially spend their time subverting, sabotaging anyone to the right of Stalin, anyone to the right of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and the way they do it is by generating smears and lies and poison and false false articles. And so they, they I, I've caught them many, many times now with previous people who've been involved very close to, to me and so on, like uh, Andrew Edge, for example, I found out that Andrew Edge had been having meetings with Hope Not Hate. They were going he he I've got him on recording saying they were gonna pay me twenty grand to lie in court so that you would go to prison. I've got Andy Edge saying this. Uh so they 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 basically throw money about, but they would pay anyone 
to make up lies about people like me, Tommy, Ashley, and so on. But what are they objecting to? They're just far left extremists. Because so far I can't see what you've done wrong. But these people are like full on Jeremy Corbyn level far left extremists. They hate this country. They hate Britain. They hate everything about us. And they want to see us overrun with immigration. And finally, you know, they want to see Britain to be uh, dismantled and, and, and destroyed. They're far left extremists, just like Jeremy Corbyn. Um, but what they do, they spend all their time focusing on what they call the far right. So they solicit donations from supporters to run campaigns to you know against people like Tommy Robinson, against people like me, Britain First, and so on. Have you been a major target of theirs? Oh, absolutely, yeah, for years. Yeah, I know for a fact they've 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 spent tens of thousands of pounds uh, trying to subvert uh, my career and Britain First and and everything. I can, I said, sorry, and anyone that's watching this now, I would also welcome anybody from Hope Not Hate to come on my podcast and I'd have a conversation with them and I'd get there. I'd, if there was a figurehead, I'd like to know their life story. Like what has inspired you to want to go out and target patriots that essentially want a better Britain? Mm. What What's your angle? What's your, what's, what's the objective? Yeah, the pro problem we have there is they're the worst, dirty, the most unscrupulous, grifting poison merchants you'll ever come across. So before we move, just one more thing about Hope Not Hate and then we'll, 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 we'll go back to when you when you come out of jail for the first time. And I'll tell you why I'm curious about Hope Not Hate. I can't remember which terror attack it was, but there was one several years ago mm. and I was on Facebook at the time and I went on a rant. I could see what had happened. I could, it was black and white, the, the situation. Mm. I aired my views on it. It got millions of views. Yeah. And people were saying, Liam, Hope not hate, you're on their website. And I was like, oh, that means nothing to me. And it didn't mean anything to me. Yeah. So whenever I hear hope not hate, I think, oh, yeah, that rings a bell because they was, well, I was on their radar at one stage because of a video I put out objecting to terrorism. That's all it was. I put yeah. out a video objecting to terrorism. Next thing, people are saying, oh, you're on their radar. Yeah. So are, are hope not hate a group to be concerned about? What uh, sort of things do they do if they want to end you? Uh, I, gave, I gave, gave that example of Andy Edge. So Andy Edge was my bodyguard for a few years. And then he kind of took a step back, had a long break because his health was problematical. Um, they approached him and said, would you like to earn some money? Uh, and then he said, yeah, definitely. How much? He said they offered him 20 grand to lie in court about some driving offence or something like that just to try and get me sent down. Um but Andy Edge, the problem with Andy Edge is that he's, he's a bit of a, an idiot and he's a bit of a drunk. And he basically used to get drunk and ring me up and I'd be sitting there recording him. So, uh, and, and my brother recorded him as well. So he, he was like, yeah, I've met Hope Not Hate. They give me cash the other day and all this kind of stuff. So basically they just try and stitch up anyone on the right of politics. And do they come gunning for the individual in a sense of you can no longer get a job anywhere else? Yeah, they try and get people sacked. They try and get people, uh, you know, kicked out of of their their homes. They're just dirty tricks all the time against anyone on the right of politics. So if I'd have continued putting out videos objecting to terror attacks, I could have quite easily become one of their targets. Yeah, and I think say if uh, Tommy, you know, holds more public protests and that, and you're there, you're making speeches, you're present, they will focus on you. Yeah, that's what they do. They will focus on you. I think, Let's look for dirt. If there's no dirt, let's try and make some dirt. And then they make some dirt, we'll pay someone to say something about him, and then we'll feed that story to the media. The media then publish it everywhere. Oh, like so that. they work with the mainstream as well? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I've caught them out time and time again. I actually, uh, we helped like a homeless v a veteran years and years and years ago, like 2019, something like that, like five years ago. And then he resurfaced last year. Um, he resurfaced and he was just, he was on the verge, like Matthew Collins was texting saying, you won't believe what's coming out in the media about Britain first treatment of a, a homeless veteran or something like that. And I thought, right, it's got to be Tom Foley. Tom Foley popped up again on, I think it was on social media of some sort. And he was really hostile to Britain first. I thought, I know what's going on here. They've, they've got hold of him. He's a down and out homeless veteran. He's a drug addict. They're obviously funding him to say a load of 
naughty stuff against Britain first. And it carries a bit of weight, you see, a, a, a homeless veteran mm. that's been taken advantage of by Britain first. That's a good story. Mm. And they just need someone, they need a homeless veteran to push it. To, so they bunged him money. What they didn't realise is, though, that we uh, had loads of recordings of this homeless veteran. And he was, uh, it was during the time that we actually was working with him to try and help him. And he was praising us to high heaven, me particularly. He said, Paul was like family to me, the way he treated me and all this kind of stuff. And I love Paul's family. He took They took me in, they looked after me. So we got a, uh, done like a video, a little expose video, and it did like the contrast between the way he was talking about the way we treated him compared to Matthew Collins' Hope Not Hate tweets. And then we, we put that up on social media and and then they, they had to dump him. Mm. And then he reacted with fury. He started posting loads of videos up. Same with Andy Edge when we caught him. They, they, they go mad that you've ruined their payday. They go crazy. They try and hurt you anyway. They try and damage you anyway. So he was posting up, oh, Britain first robbed me. they then done this to me, done that to me. Really? What's this recording about then? This recording, you're saying that they're basically your family, the way they treated you. So, yeah, that's the kind of dirty tricks that Hope Not Hate gets up to. They, they will they will pay money to anyone mm. to tell lies about people like me or Tommy. They've, they've subverted many people that have been surrounding Tommy before. Well, my heart goes out to anybody that's that's on their radar that's being subjected to that kind of uh, attack. Mm. So when you come out of prison the first time, mobile phone in your hand, it was like being in orbit. Yeah, it was a really strange feeling, yeah. How did you bounce back from four weeks in solitary? It only took a few days to adjust. Um, I started getting back down the gym. I started to organise activities again, just got back into it. And did Britain first run itself while you was in jail? But yeah, things pretty much run themselves for four weeks. It's only if it's longer than that, it starts to go a bit, you know, derailed. So you come out and everything was as it was? Yeah, absolutely. And then in uh, 2017... A 15-year-old English girl is drunk, a little bit drunk, from a night out. Uh, and she she's wandering past a row of shops in Ramsgate in Kent, seaside town. She walks past a kebab shop. Uh, she pops her head in to ask for directions because she's a bit lost. Uh, the, the men in that kebab shop were all immigrants or illegal immigrants. And they seize her. They grab her, drag her upstairs, and spend about six hours gang raping her, taking turns. They're all arrested. It becomes a massive news story across the whole country. The kebab shop, now here's, here's what really wound everyone up. Despite all of their DNA being found on this girl, who's only 15, they all got bowed with no conditions. And very quickly, they were back running their kebab shop a few days later. So obviously we thought, right, they need the Britain First treatment. The BFT. The BFT. So we went down there. Um, we went to com tried to confront them in the kebab shop, but they closed the door just in time. We went to, um, uh, I used my uh, dark arts box of tricks to find out where they all lived. And we went to their home addresses. So you imagine they live at number 10. So we go and we're banging on number 10 telling them to come out and, and speak to us and all this kind of stuff, calling them dirty racists and so on. But at the same time, we've got a special leaflet that we leaflet everyone else in that road saying, be careful, number 10, the guy is on trial with DNA evidence for gang of an underage girl. So be careful. If you've got kids, be careful. So we put these leaflets out amongst their neighbours. Um, so then I think about two weeks passed after we'd done all of this. The videos went up, went viral, et cetera, et cetera. And whereabouts was this? Ramsgate in Kent. Ramsgate. At that time, I lived in Tunbridge. So I came out I came out of um, my house and I'd, I'd driven... Where, where I was living, doesn't matter what direction you're driving, you end up going through country lanes. So I'm going through a country lane and I don't know if you've ever been the subject of a, an, a, an SAS-style ambush, but it's quite incredible. It's quite... It's quite an experience. <laughs> so we had a car swerve in front. We had a car swerve up behind. A car blocked us in from that one. Everyone jumped out, surrounded the car. Police officers. 
it was an ambush. So they they caught us, on and, and as they was arresting us, they were kicking the front door off of the house that I just left. All of the laptops, memory sticks, hard drives, everything cleaned out. It's, well, they must have taken the kettle. There's nothing left. So then, so we we're obviously taken. We kept in custody for twenty four hours. Tunbridge Police Station. We get charged with religiously aggravated harassment, which is quite a, it's relatively serious. Religiously aggravated makes it in, makes it into a serious offence. Um, and then months later, we're put on trial. We look, this is a foregone conclusion. It doesn't matter the context. To any reasonable person, what we did was just try to alert all the neighbours to the, the monster that they had in their midst, especially if they had children or female children. So I thought that was, I thought that was a good thing, reasonable thing to do. Um, but nevertheless, we had this complete tosspot of a judge who was a stuck-up middle-class Tory, um, and it, it turns out it was in the media actually that the case was so high-profile that the Attorney General had got involved. The Attorney General, of course, was part of the Conservative government. He's a politician. A politician with a bit of legal background becomes the Attorney General, but he's a politician. So this politician had got involved in our case. So this judge knew what to do. Whether he was told to find us guilty, no matter what, regardless, or whether he was just put under sufficient scrutiny for, oh, I better, I'm not going to have a career if I find them innocent here, you know. The powers that be will ruin my career. But this tosspot found us guilty um, and I got sent immediately to Elmley Prison. So this was my second time being transported to a prison and I thought, well, nothing to worry about really because they'll probably just put you in isolation again. A little bit, little bit longer, but... How long did you get? Uh, I, I uh, Inside prison, I did nine weeks. So just over double of what I got last time. Um, but I knew that I knew the tr I knew the game by then. I knew the tricks. So y you get inducted into a prison. You get taken in there. Uh, you get sat down with the that's like the warden or the or the head of the wing or the spur or whatever it is. He sat down, talked to me about my needs and all this kind of stuff. But I said, look, I'll be honest with you. If you don't give me my own cell, every English white fella in there, I'm going to recruit them into my own little personal army. And it worked a treat because he said, okay, straight away. <laughs> you're in your own cell so I didn't have a cellmate to contend with because um, you never in my position you never know who you're going to get mm. it's supposed to be random but you, you take that away from them the ability to for them to put someone in there who could then attack you you, know, you, you imagine if they put an asylum seeker in there or a, a violent gang member who'd been put in there for, for knife crimes they put him in the bunk above me I'd have to sleep with one eye open mm. so I thought the way to get around this is just to dish out a load of hollow threats. So I said to him, I said, straight, I said, I, if you don't give me my own cell, I'm just going to recruit my own army to keep me safe in here. And he went, all right, yeah, you can have your own cell. High, a high-profile prisoner. Um, so I had my own cell. They put me onto a nice quiet wing, the induction wing. Now, unlike the previous time, I wasn't subject to 24-hour bang-up. I wasn't just, you know, locked away 24-7. They actually gave me a normal prison regime this time. So I was mixing with other prisoners, um, but then a couple of days later, I noticed they put two bearded Muslims onto the induction wing. And then very quickly, I could see them staring at me and talking amongst themselves and, you know, behaviour like that. Your own self-preservation kicks in. You see stuff like that. You see it once and then you start to look for it and you see it all the time. I could tell they were, they, they, they were hostile at the minimum or they were plotting something at worst. So I went, to, so I went to see the staff and I said, look, I'm going to be honest with you. I see these two Muslims, the bearded ones that you've put on this induction wing. I've seen the way they're looking at me. I said, you need to keep an eye on this situation because it guaranteed over the next few days it's going to go bang. And they went, all right, we'll relay that to the supervising officer or whatever it is. Uh, so I returned back to my cell. The next day I'm actually in my cell watching... Um, Prime Minister's Question Time. Now, usually I wouldn't watch that in a million years, but because you're so bored in prison, you've got to latch onto every tiny shred of entertainment you can. So I'm watching Prime Minister's Questions. And this Labour MP jumps up and, and I'm sitting there eating my lunch like this, just l looking at the telly occasionally, but I'm listening to it. A Labour MP jumps up and says, will the House 
join me in congratulating Facebook for finally taking down the hateful pages of far-right group Britain First. And the whole commons was like, yay. And I'm like, it all could get spit out. I'm like, what? So we had 2.2 million followers on Facebook at that point. So I'm sitting here like this in shock. All that hard work, building it up year after year after year. Our, our voice, our platform, poof, up in a cloud of smoke, just like that. So as soon as I got the opportunity, I got on the, the phone and said, what's happening? Is, have they gone, really? And they said, yeah, they've all gone. All just gone, disappeared. So that depressed me a little bit mm. while I was sat in a cell. Um, the next day, I'm sitting there eating my lunch, exactly the same time again. If you imagine your sign there is the TV, <clears throat> or it's sort of over that way, in that direction. I'm sitting here facing that way, eating my lunch. All of a sudden, I hear bang, really loud bang. And as soon as I've turned that way, where the door to my cell was, I've turned this way, immediately I can see the two Muslims that had been eyeballing me for days are in my cell. They've shut the door. Um, I didn't even have a time to think. I was so disoriented straight away. As soon as I turned that way, the one closest to me just punt, just right hooked me directly on the nose. Now, have you been punched on the nose before? Oh, yes. Instant confusion <laughs> and disorientation. My nose is pumping out blood all down me. I've actually never seen so much blood on mm. my own blood before. But thankfully, when I'd started getting up, they both ran out the cell. They ran back to their own cells and closed the door. Uh, so, yeah, that was that was quite a, a vicious attack. And then it blew up all in the media. Paul Golding gets his nose broke by an, an Iraqi asylum seeker. I didn't know he was an asylum seeker at the time. Uh, my nose wasn't broke. It just he managed to punch me directly on the on the end of it, and it just mm. pumped out with blood. Uh, it became big news. I remember watching it on the TV later that evening while I'm in my cell. I was watching the attack on TV. And was the was the mainstream media reveling in the fact that you'd been a target? Not not overtly, but you, you got, they got this smug style of writing. Mm. No, far right, far right extremist leader Paul Golding has his nose broken by an Iraqi asylum seeker in prison, and it's kind of smug. Um, so then, what happened was a few a few days later, well, I was locked down for about twenty four hours. I wasn't allowed out of my cell, and then shortly after that, they burst in my cell, the prison guards, and said, "Right, we're moving you around the corner now to a proper wing." I was like, "Okay, I don't like being moved around in prison because once you get settled somewhere, mm. you kind of feel safe." Then they move you, it creates anxiety because you don't know where they're moving me to, who's going to be surrounding me, who's going to be on my wing, on my landing, and so on. It's, it's like you're staring into the unknown straight away. So they said, we're moving you around the corner. You imagine a central uh, control area, like a control pod, and then you've got the spurs coming off of it. It was that type of prison. So they moved me from A spur to B spur. So they've put me in there. They said, here's your cell. It's disgusting. I had to clean it. I had to wash up and clean up again. Uh, and then the doors opened and I get all these these English fellas, white English fellas in their like 20s or 30s coming up to me. I know you are, Paul. Yeah, I've been watching you for the last few days. I've been watching you on the news and all this. One of them says, if you get any trouble, just come and see me and I'll, I'll back you up and all this. So I'm starting to feel a bit relaxed. I've almost got a little bit of support. Mm. Um, a couple of hours later, one of them actually comes into my cell and says, listen, I need to tell you, just been up on the two landings up, the Muslim lifers who are doing life, they're already plotting. That They literally said one of them is going to take the glory of stabbing you, of killing you. Um, so I thought, what do I do here? Do I, um, you know, stand my ground and get stuck in, see what happens? I thought, no, just, you know, it's not worth it. So I told the prison guards, I said, look, this has just happened. And the guy came with me and he said, I've just heard them talking about it upstairs. So they locked me down on my cell. Association's over. Everyone gets locked down. The next morning, bright and early, the screws burst into my cell again. So they come on, we're moving you. I think, oh, fuck it, here we go again. It's just a nightmare. It's literally, when you're in the middle of all of this, it's, it's, a, it's an absolute nightmare. So they take me and they put me down the block you know the punishment block mm -hmm. where you're put into horrible, I mean, they're the most disgusting cells imaginable because they're just abused by the worst prisoners in the, in the whatever prison you're in. So they put me in the block in a cell with no TV and it's rancid. 
They said, we're going to keep you here for a while while we figure out what we can do with you to keep you safe. I'm like, okay, whatever. So for the, for, for the week after that, seven days, all I had was books. That week was one of the hardest I've ever had to go through. I don't know why, but not even having a TV. I'm used, to, I'm used to having a mobile phone in my hand, a laptop in front of me, and then I'm in this cell, and all I've got is a few books. And you wake up early, you go to bed late, and you're just grinding boredom, even without a TV. And then after a week, they moved me around the corner, still on the punishment block, but the, the only cell with a TV port, because mm. they're supposed to be punishment isolation cells, so you don't get TV. There's not even the ports in there for them. But they luckily, one of them on the punishment block had a TV port, so they moved me to that one. I had a TV. They kept me on the punishment block for an entire month, four weeks I was in a punishment block. So again, 24-hour bang up, um, just like Pensonville. Uh, and then about a month later, I thought, Do you know what? I've got five weeks left of this crap. That's four weeks, but that's not. four weeks left of this crap. I could probably just stay in here for four weeks. And then about five in the morning, the screws burst in my cell and say, right, you're being transferred. Here we go again. So I'm all chained up and they put me into this car and I've got four other screws in the car with me. And they, they start driving away. I said, guys, where are we heading? Because they wouldn't tell me up to that point. I said, yeah, you're being transferred to Liverpool. I was like, fuck it. Well, I'm in Kent. And they're transferring me to Liverpool. I was like, what's, what's, prison, what's uh, Liverpool prison like? Went, oh, you won't like it. It's a bloody war zone. Knife crime, everything up there. It's just like the worst thing you, you want to hear. It really is. Uh, we stopped about halfway at services. And I said, look, I need a toilet. I can't hold it anymore. Uh, and they said, you want a drink and all that. So they got me out. Imagine this. You're with four prison officers. You pull up at a motorway services. They get you out the car in chains. Yeah? And they're leading you in chains into the services. So you imagine I'm walking along, like the Shawshank Redemption, in chains with these four screws surrounding me. They walk me to the toilet and then they walk me back to the car. It was so surreal. And I was looking mm. around, everyone was looking like it's not something you see regularly, is it? A no. chained prisoner being being led for a services. Being allowed the rights for a piss. Yeah. Uh, and then we got to Liverpool Prison and thankfully, thankfully, I think they made the right decision because Liverpool Prison, again, it's 170 years old. It's a Victorian prison. It's disgusting and rank, but it's half empty. They're planning to knock it down soon. So they're emptying it out. So it's half empty. So they put me in, again, on my own landing. I was in this cell and five cells in every direction were empty. I was literally really isolated. And again, I was on, I think maybe 20, 22, 23 hour bang up. But I was allowed out for an hour a day for phone calls and, and all the other stuff. Did you feel exposed and vulnerable when you had that hour? Free? No, not in Liverpool prison. No? Um, by that time, I was five weeks into my prison and I'd grown a massive beard. It's like, you know, it's, <laughs> Tommy came out of Belmarsh and he had a big thing going on. Yeah. yeah. Because the thing is, when you're in prison, they think, why'd you let your beard get out of control like that? Well, it's quite simple. The only razors you can get are really cheap, nasty little things. And also they're expensive. So you say, right, this week... You get a sheet of paper, it's called your canteen. You get a sheet of paper and you've got 20 quid to spend. You're not going to spend 12 quid on a razor. You want to buy crisps, you want to buy chocolate, you want to buy, you know, anything you can. You don't want to be wasting a huge chunk of it on a razor. Mm. And when you move around, like I was moved around a lot, your canteen resets. So if you're kept in the same place, your canteen keeps increasing. But where you keep moving around, it kept resetting down to 15 quid. So I'm not going to spend 12 quid on a razor, especially one that's going to cut me face to pieces. So you just let it grow. It also acts as a bit of a disguise. Have you got any pictures of you with a beard? Yeah, it's quite quite funny. Um, so I'm in Liverpool prison and it's half empty and it's all like local white scouse, scouser, petty criminals in their 20s. It's really quiet. It's hardly any fights. And I did the next four weeks in there and it went really quickly because it was it was quite nice actually. Apart from the there's a lot of cockroaches in that prison. A lot of them. And cockroaches, I don't know about you, but they they physically repulse me. And I, I they instantly make me homicidal. So I'm always chasing these <laughs> bastard cockroaches around, trying to murder them on a big scale. Um Yeah, they're not for me. So yeah, so it comes to the point, I think, right, yeah, I've got a I'm being released tomorrow. I arranged with my father. He drives all the way up from Kent, all the way up to Liverpool to pick me up. Yeah. 
So I'm being processed to be released. Now, when I'm being released, they said, you've got, you've got to take this as well. This is a five-year firearms ban, but it also applies to air guns and BB guns and all that, anything like that. It covers that as well. So that's five-year firearms ban. So they slapped that on. Uh, so I'm, I'm finally released, and I'm literally walking out the gates, and I know my father is around the corner in the car park. And I thought, brilliant, I can't wait. I get my phone, I can start ringing people, I can start update, I can start, you know, living again. And all of a sudden, there's two cars parked up on the right. And as I'm walking closer to them, I think it was eight plain clothes, SO15 counter-terrorism command officers all of a sudden leap out the car and walk over to me. I'm like, what's going on here? And Mr. Golding, you've got to come with us. And they hand me some paperwork. I'm like, okay, well, who are you? And I look, and it's SO15 counter-terrorism command. This nation's elite counter-terrorism officers. So they've intercepted me. My father's just around the corner. I'm that close to freedom. And it turns out that, uh, no, I wasn't being released. I wasn't being given my freedom. They said, we're taking you to London because you're going to spend the next month in a probation hostel. You're not allowed to go home. So eight elite anti-terrorism officers intercepted me just to take me to a probation office, a probation hostel. I mean, how ridiculous is that? What a waste of resources. And they didn't tell you that during sentencing? No. This was sprung on me literally at the gates as I'm that close to my freedom, that, that close to jumping in my uh, father's car and then travelling back to Kent. And did they give a reason for that? It was it was so that they could inconvenience me for a little bit longer. But did they say what their no, justification they, was? They just said, we've been told, we've got to take you to this. So they've taken me to this probation hostel, which is essentially, you imagine a big detached mansion in a leafy part of Ealing in West London. So I turn up at this huge mansion, which has been divided into flats. So I get my own flat. I'm allowed a phone, but it's only, it's not allowed an internet connection. So it's like one of the old Nokia 3310s, mm. but it's better than nothing. I quickly found out that the other people in that probation hostel were like murderers, armed robbers, drug traffickers, serious bird, serious crime. They've been, in, they've been inside for so long that they came out of prison. They were released after like 20 years and they, they put them into these probation hostels to give them somewhere to live so that they can readjust to normal life. So you have to be doing long bird mm. in order to, 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 to be put in one of these. I did nine weeks and I had somewhere to go back to. So they put me in there and it was during, I was a few days in and then Tommy was... Um, Tommy was arrested outside Leeds Crown Court and that just blew up massive. Mm. Remember he was arrested and put in prison straight away. Yeah. And it was the free Tommy demos and all that kind of stuff in Whitehall and, and so on. So that was all happening while I was in this probation hostel. So as I was kind of coming out, he was going in. The day they released me from the probation hostel, I was allowed to go back to live at my mother's because I had to give up my house. If I'd known it was going to be nine weeks, I might have held on to it, but it could have been six months. So I thought, get rid of the house and just go into prison. So I went to live at my mother's house and I was finally free. They slapped this, this new thing they've got called a post-sentence supervision order. So I got one of these and it was, as you can imagine, very restrictive. I've got to let my probation officer know where I'm sleeping every single night. Uh, I'm not allowed to, to, to do this, to do that, et cetera, et cetera. Did you have a curfew? Uh, I did in the probation hostel. I had to sign a piece of paper twice a day in the probation hospital and that made sure that I had to... I couldn't go out early in the morning and come back late at night because mm. they did. You got a sign on at eleven a.m. and six p.m. So you can't really do much. You, you, it anchors you to that house. Uh, so immediately, it's the first day in my mother's. I said to my probation officer, "I want to go. I want to travel to Northern Ireland. Here's the hotel I'll be staying in. Here's my flights. Here's everything. All the information that I need to give you." <clears throat> and he didn't respond. He didn't respond. Next thing I know, the following day I go boxing. While I'm in boxing, about 10 to 15 police officers turn up at my house, my mum's house where I'm staying, to arrest me again. Luckily I wasn't there. We've got the CCTV footage of them turning up. So when I get back, my mother rings me in a panic. And When I get back, I ring up my probation officer. He cuts off all contact with me, so I don't know... 
I know the police are looking for me and I don't know what for. I've done nothing wrong. I'm abiding by the terms of my post-sentence supervision order. I don't know what the hell's going on. Then I get a phone call from SO15 Counter-Terrorism Command. You've got to come to Bromley Magistrates Court tomorrow morning at 9am. So we get into the Magistrates Court. There's a whole bloody trial prepared, ready to go. So they're, they're basically trying to send me back to prison for breaching my post-sentence supervision order. Do you know like when you come out of prison, you're on licence? Mm-hmm. It's a little bit similar to that, but it's after your total sense, sentence has ended, if that makes sense. And what did you do in their eyes to breach it? They said, because I intended to go to Northern Ireland to the 12th of July loyalist parades, that was a breach of my post-sentence supervision. And my my solicitor just said, okay, you know, what provision, what part of this order did he breach? I said, really, I hadn't, I hadn't done anything. But by the time I dealt with all of this nonsense at Bromley Magistrates Court, the 12th of July celebrations had been and gone. So it was just a way of keeping keeping me away from Northern Ireland over the 12th of July weekend. Uh, so these the magistrates, after about three hours of wasting their time, they came back in and said, look, we don't believe he's breached his post-sentence supervision order, so he can go. So that was 2017 when that all come to an end? No, that was 2018. Right, okay. So I was sent to prison in March 2018, I was released and a free man by, sort of, I think it was June or something like that. Then I set about immediately rebuilding Britain first because it had completely collapsed. Well, can I ask a few short, sharp questions before we move on to the last six years? Mm. From 2008 into two, 2024, because that's, 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 again, that's another interesting chapter. But also, there'll be a part two, I'd imagine, because there's so much more to your life. And people that know Paul... I'm sure we'll be acutely aware that we couldn't cram his whole life into into one short podcast. So the likelihood there will be a part two. So if there's any questions that haven't been answered or anything I've not covered within this interview, use the comment section, take advantage of it, and put some constructive comments and questions in there. But so just a few short, sharp questions before we move on to the, to the last six years uh, that I'm sure people will be saying in the comments. So we can just clear that up now. Yeah. Are you a racist? No. Not in the dictionary definition of a racist. Someone who hates other people because they're of a different race. No, that's 100% not. It's not the case. That's it. That's my answer. Okay. Hell no. Have you got a far right mentality? And can you explain what far right is? Well... These days, someone is far right when they disagree with the left, the radical left. If you, if you don't appreciate mass immigration, then you're far right. If, if you love Britain, love your own country, and you want to celebrate that, you're far right. I mean, that's essentially what it's, that's where we're at right now in 2024. That's what it's come to. Uh, so pretty, pretty much everyone's far right extremist. I mean, it, like Suella Braverman and Nigel Farage, who are in no way, shape or form far right. They got uh, their Brussels meeting closed down a few days ago by an extreme left wing local mayor. So every, everyone, you know, from Trump to Nigel Farage and everyone in between is just it's just being labelled far right these days. But it's a way for the left to demonise people without actually dealing with their arguments, without actually debating them, without actually dissecting what they really stand for and what they want and what they hope to achieve. Just call them far right. Mm. Just call people far right. Don't argue with them. Don't debate with them. If they, if you disagree with them, they're far right. And that's what it's, that's where we're at at the moment. It's incredible how far more sinister the term far right is to far left. Far left is just like whatever. Far right is like, okay, you've got my attention. Not yeah, in a good if, way. I think, oh, you know, 30 years ago, the Soviet Union, maybe. Mm. You know, it's just an old-fashioned communist. But... It hasn't got the all of the uh, stigma and baggage attached to it like the term far right. But I think chronic overuse of the term far right has actually made it a bit of a badge of honour in this day and age. Mm. I always say to people, I'm far right and proud. Mm. Yeah, because it means that I'm not... For one, it means I'm not a corrupt, self-serving career politician. And it, it actually means that I'm pro-British rather than anti-British. That's what it means. And... Let's just delve into Islam very, very quickly. So you've got Muslims, you've got Islam, you've got 
radical Islam, you've got radical Muslims. Mm. You're obviously objecting to the radical side, but how do you how do you perceive you and feel about a Muslim that goes about his day to day life and he's got no interest in the extreme side of it? Yeah. Are you okay with them or is this still a problem? Yeah, with them? absolutely. Hundred percent. And it's been like that from since day one. But the media, if you oppose radical Islam, if you oppose extremists, they will ra- they will still call you far right. They'll still call you Islamophobic, even though essentially you're just opposing extremists and terrorists. But nevertheless, uh, ordinary Muslims, and I know a lot of them are getting a lot of Ubers and, and so I speak to people and, and, and so on. The problem we have in this country is that there is a significant percentage of the Islamic community that holds extremist beliefs. It's a significant minority. And that significant minority is of a a sufficient size to warrant a serious probe into the situation that we have at the moment because it creates terrorism, grooming gangs uh, and all levels of extremism across the board. So no no one in this country, I don't think, has got any issues with ordinary working Muslims who pay their taxes and obey the law and there are millions of them. Most people's focus these days is on the extremists, on the terrorists or hate preachers and so on. And there is a a significant danger and a significant problem in this country. Uh, We just saw a few days ago, we saw a jihadist attack a priest in Sydney, a knife attack. Uh, And then a couple of weeks, was it a week before that, we saw an Islamic terrorist attack in Moscow. And it's just constant terror attacks all across the West, whether they're low level or really big, bad atrocities. But it is a, it is a massive problem in this country. And there's a, an opinion poll recently where something like one third of all British Muslims want to see Sharia law in the UK over the next 20 years. That's a problem because Sharia law is not welcome in this country. So when you say, are you against Islam? I would say I'm against parts of Islam. I don't, want, I don't want this country to become a Muslim country. I don't want to see the growth and expansion of Islam in my country because I'm a Christian, this is a Christian country, we are Christians. That's just normal. You want to preserve your own uh, nation, your own heritage. So I'm a, a, against certain parts of Islam, 100%, and I'll say that proudly. I'm against halal slaughter. I'm against the oppression of women. I'm against the primacy of jihad in Islam. I'm against the separation in Islam between the Dalao Harb and the Dalao Dalao Islam, which is essentially their mindset. So you're either a Muslim or you're an infidel. End of. No in between. Uh, And it's called the house of war for a reason, because you're supposed to be a good Muslim. You're supposed to wage war against it. You're supposed to wage jihad against it. So there's all these different things in Islam that, yeah, I would disagree with vehemently. Like Sharia law is a perfect example. Halal slaughter is a perfect example. Yeah, of course I'm against them. But am I against a law-abiding, tax-paying Muslim? No, of course I'm not. But there are certain problems relating to the presence of Islam in Britain. One is extremist mosques. That's a big problem. Uh, Another would be uh, grooming gangs. That seems to be very much an Islamic, Pakistani issue all across the country. So we can take a look at these things, but the left left don't want you criticising anyone Anyone at all uh, that is Islamic, like literally no one. If you criticise Anjim Chowdhury, they will label you Islamophobic because, again, it's another bogey word to try and silence debate and criticism and discussion. So they're, they're, it's another way of clamping down on free speech. And to satisfy the comments section, if there was singular or a group of far-right extremist Christians, being a Christian man, would you target them equally as hard as you would extreme Muslims? Yes, and I always have done. I'm the only one who's been, who's in the BNP for decades, right? I'm the only one who's been through there and came out of it with no baggage. No one can say, ah, but what about this recording or this photo of your time in the BNP? There's nothing. Because even in the BNP, I was always trying to modernise it and moderate it, make it pre- mainstream so that it would gain success and support. Um, And I just, as a Christian, I just think it's daft to to, to harbour hatred for another man or person 
because of their ethnicity. They can't help that. And you can criticise the choices a person makes, but we're all made in the image of God. This country is historically a white Christian nation, and I want to see it preserved that way. Ethnic minorities should always be minorities. We're at this, We're in a situation now with the Great Replacement and the promotion of feminism and, and the LGBT ideology where our birth rate has collapsed, but we're allowing in millions and millions of third world immigrants. So just like in London, where the white British population is now down to 35%, just 35% of the population in London is white British, that's going to be writ large across the entire country. That is us being replaced in our own country. So when I talk about these issues, it's, it's not even from a position of race. It's from a position of space, mass immigration. You don't take a small, overcrowded, tiny island like Britain and say, right, let's just flood it with millions of immigrants until it's just completely like a huge tower block, a huge concrete jungle. It's, it's insane. So these the globalist plans and, and uh, objectives of the left, in my opinion, in this country, are going to lead to some sort of civil war, civil strife, and it's going to end badly. It's going to end in tears. That's uh, uh, no one wants that to happen. But I think if you, uh, it, because of the policies of the establishment and the mainstream parties and the media, their support for multiculturalism and diversity and open borders and mass immigration, all this nonsense, it's going to end in tears, because you can only flood a country with foreigners to a certain point before the natives rebel. That's common sense, because they're losing what they've got, their own country. It's common sense. So all of that is nothing to do with being a racist. It's to do with being a realist. And it's it's a nationalist outlook as opposed to a globalist outlook. And that's what Britain First is, a nationalist party. And it actually leads me on to my final question before we then flow back to your story from 2018. Is Britain First a dangerous organisation? Uh, you're talking about the... Uh, I think it was a Channel 4 headline that said that Britain First was the most dangerous far-right organisation in Britain. I've seen that headline several times whilst doing my research, and yeah. I just want to say for the record, up till now, you don't seem like a dangerous person. You I, don't know me that well. No, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, is, 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 is Britain First a dangerous organisation? We are a danger, so to speak, to the old gang corrupt politicians who've wrecked this country and destroyed this country and robbed us of our inheritance and betrayed our war heroes. We're a danger to them in a political sense, not in a physical criminal sense. No, we're, we're a danger to the Westminster elite because we will hold them accountable for what they've done. I'll tell you why I asked that question, is Britain first a, a dangerous organisation? Not only have I read the tabloids, uh, those clickbait titles that immediately instill shock and horror, but there was something else I read and it was about how Britain first would use their social media, Facebook in particular, and yeah. it was words to this effect that... Britain First use their Facebook page to recruit in exactly the same way ISIS do. Now, if you read that, they're putting Britain First and ISIS in the, the same, same bracket, yeah. in the same bracket. I mean, how do you feel about articles like that, headlines like that, putting you in the same sentence as ISIS? Uh, you just simply don't care because, you know, at this point it's inconsequential because we're living in an age now where the, the whole Bre Brexit fiasco, you know, like the media calling everyone who voted Brexit a racist and constant media liars and poison, and especially in America with Trump. We're at the point now where people like Nigel Farage or Tommy Robinson or me or Britain First, we get attacked relentlessly by Katie the media. Hopkins. Katie Hopkins. You'll find that all of these people who are attacked by the media are all popular. That tells you by default that the, the power of the media has been destroyed. Mm. So, yeah, it's frustrating, but it's also a water off a duck's back because no one believes anything anymore. No one believes any of this crap. It's probably now a stage where people that can now see right through the mainstream media tactics will look at that and it will it will irritate them because it's an, it's an insult on the common man's intelligence. You can just yeah. see what, what yeah. they're doing with that. Their concept is like every day they're trying to say the sky, the sky is green, the sky is green, the sky is green. Mm. And ordinary people now can look up and they think, no, it's not. So they don't believe it anymore. Uh, and that act of looking up and seeing for yourself is essentially, that's social media now. Because if you're being told Paul Golding or Tommy Robinson or Kate Hopkins or Nigel Farage, they're terrible, they're liars, they're, they're racists, they're far right, 
And then you open up your phone and you go on Facebook or Twitter and you click a video of Katie Hopkins, click a video of Tommy or whoever, just examples. You think, actually, what he just said is bloody spot on. Mm. What she's just said is, is I, I totally agree with her. So there's a massive disconnect now between what the media is saying and what you can see for yourself on social media. And there's a disconnect. The power of the media is gone. So I'm not, I'm not bothered what they write anymore. Mm. Do you know what? There's loads of questions I'll keep asking. One more before we go back. What's your what's your overall view on Sadiq Khan? Sadiq Khan? Mm. <laughs> you might have to edit this bit out. It's a present yeah. for you, Paul. You might- <laughs> <laughs> this part of the uh, podcast, you might have to uh, edit out. Um, yeah, he's a particularly loathsome individual. I've actually stood next to him before when I stood for Mayor of London in 2016. You turned your back on him? I did, yeah. I ruined his big night. We were all called up on stage. There was, was me and there was all the Green Party candidate, the Tories, and there was Sadiq Khan. There was all of us all lined up. And when he was called forth to give his victory speech, I turned my back on him. And as soon as I turned my back, I heard all the shutters of the media cameras just exploding. Uh, and it made international news, international headlines. And the focus was not on Sadiq Khan's victory or his victory speech. The focus was on the far-right bogeyman turning his back on him as a, as a kind of, uh, you know, up yours. So let's go back to the last six years. From 2018, you come out of come out of jail, you got put in the halfway house, then you was on, you was under scrutiny, you had to report yeah, back Yeah, post-sentence supervision for a year. How did you continue with your life? Well, when I came out of prison, uh, we'd lost Facebook which was a big shock because we'd always relied on that to get our message out. You know, millions and millions of people could see Britain First and watch Britain First. That was all gone. So then I had to dig deep. How can we survive and thrive in an environment where there's massive censorship and cancel culture going on everywhere? Uh, And it was, we did figure it out eventually because we'd produce videos and then we'd, send the email out, the email bulletins out to our vast email list and I'll direct them to watch a video and then beg them to share it, which would then be shared onto social media so other people could see it. So we were still reaching like a million, two million people a month, but it was primarily for our website. Yeah. So we, when I came out of prison in 2018, Britain First had dried up all the activists had walked, uh, walking away. A payment system had been closed down. Facebook had been closed down. We was on the, the bones of our ass, re- badly. Um, but I thought, no, we're gonna. Don't care how long it takes. We're going to rebuild the entire movement from scratch. And we just, I just got to work. And, it and just, how do you fund the movement? Just we've got an email list that we've collected over the years. People have signed up. People have joined. People have donated, and we we capture email addresses like that. And we've got subscriptions, the right, yeah, subscriptions, uh, all, all sorts of stuff. So we 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 run petitions. We have got the right to email them and so on. So we've built up quite a huge email list, uh, and that so that keeps us going. So uh, when we send out the emails, people then on that list they make donations or they join as the party or they uh, purchase merchandise. So these sort of grassroots micro payments, uh, they fund our because we we haven't got communist trade unions like Labour, mm. we haven't got dodgy big businessmen like the Tories looking for peerages and seats in the House of Lords. Uh, we're a grassroots movement, and donations and stuff like that funds our activities. And we go out there and we just you can tell the Britain First is by far the most active organisation in this country in terms of you know we're out all the time. Most other most other organisations, parties, they sit on their hands most of the time. They hold a meeting, then two months later they'll hold a maybe a day of action, then they'll stand in an election. Britain First is constantly active, non-stop, boom, 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 boom. Um, and this attracts people to us. You know, when you see people active, see people doing stuff, and if you're that way inclined, you will get involved yourself. Mm. So, yeah, we we focus on hyperactivity, standing in every election that comes along, we became a political party a few years ago. We had to fight the Electoral Commission for years and years and years to try and be registered. They blocked us. How did that feel when you actually become a political party? So it took four years. Did you break your sobriety and have a glass of champagne? No, actually. I was just walking out of an osteopath in Manchester, just having my back cracked. Um, 
And I just got the email for him saying, you, you've been approved. And that, that, that was at the end of four years of hard work. We dragged them all the way to the high court. Eventually, after four years, we forced them to register us. Since then, we've been standing in elections. We've had good results. We've had terrible results. It's been a bit of a mixed bag. We've had some, we've had some good results, which, which bode well for the future. I mean, like in a recent Tamworth election last year, um, we beat the Liberal Democrats. We beat the Green Party. We beat UKIP. Um, we, we, we come just behind reform. We came fourth just behind reform. So if reform wasn't there, we probably would have come third mm. uh, behind Labour and Tories. That's a statement. Uh, exactly. But then in the, in the next by-election in Wellingborough, we got a, a terrible result, which was quite, quite a shock. Um, but I think the media is now starting, the establishment is starting to artificially boost and promote reform because I think they sense that they feel a situation brewing like back in 2010 where they need to promote a safety valve so that everyone starts voting for that instead of an up-and-coming genuine nationalist party like Britain First. Outside of the mainstream parties, we are the biggest and the most well-funded political party in this country outside of, I'd say, maybe five of the mainstream parties. We've got two offices. We've got a fleet of battle buses. Uh, we've got multiple staff working every day. Uh, we've got a huge email list, a huge membership, and it's all just going in one direction. It's creeping up. It's not an avalanche. It's not mm. like taking off like a rocket, but it's just steadily, it's steadily growing and, and, and increasing. And that's what you want. Because if you fast forward the tape five years, we're going to be a, we're going to be very, very in a very powerful position in this country. So, I feel like I've had Paul the politician mm. sat in front of me for quite some time now. I want to go. I want to go back to Paul the person. After twenty five years, it's quite difficult to separate. Are, you, are your parents still alive? Yes. Have your parents ever told you how it makes them feel to see their son being jailed? Yeah, of course. I think it was it was more of a shock to them or more harsh on them many, many years ago. I think these days, I think it's just, oh, Paul's been nicked again. <laughs> Paul, <laughs> Paul's been prosecuted again. Paul's had another terrorist death threat, you know. As you, yeah, I mean, you're getting death threats from terrorists. Has your, has your mum ever, you know, shed a tear and said, like, Paul, please, can you stop? Not my mother. My mother's a, a kind of a, a real tough kind of South London Cockney uh, woman. But I think my, my father does worry about me, yeah. You know, he understands I've got to do what I've got to do, but he just wants me to be careful. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I had an Osman warning about six months ago from the police. Great Manchester police came and sat down in my house and uh, gave me his piece of paper. Says so been a credible threat to life and all this kind of stuff. So I just thought, this is brilliant. I'll take a photo of this and put this straight on Twitter. Mm. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that the only Osman warning you've had? No, no, I've had quite a few Osman warnings. Osman warnings for people that don't know at home is basically the police have done, well, the police have heard from a reliable source that there's a contract out on your life. Yeah. So when they get intelligence that there's a, a credible, not just, not just waffle, mm. but a credible threat to someone's life, they have to deliver them an Osman warning. And how many have you had? Oh, I, I think I've had about four, but... There's stuff they haven't told me about. For example, back in 2015, when I was chasing the Islamists around London, um, there was actually a terrorist duo that was plotting to chop my head off. And they got, but they, they got one of these, do you know these dummies you find in gyms? It's like a, a, a torso, a human torso. Yeah, like an MMA. You, you can yeah. punch it, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a dummy. They bought one of them and they was practising beheading it, practising slitting its throat and stuff like that. Thankfully, the intelligence services got wind of it and started putting them under surveillance. So they was plotting. Their, their goal was, their plot was to chop my head off. They was going to behead me. They was going to behead Katie Hopkins. So we were both the targets. So I didn't even know about this. They broke the law by not giving me an Osman warning. Uh, so what happened was it went to trial, as you can imagine, and when it went to trial, it generated publicity. So here I am looking at a newspaper for the first time, terrorist duo on trial for plotting to behead Paul Golding. And I'm like, oh, no one told me about this. So there's probably a lot of stuff that the police don't tell me about, which they are legally bound to do, but they, some they don't. And that's a good example. They did not tell me that there's um, a, a threat of beheading at that time. I never got no Osman warnings that year when they was plotting their terrorism. And how does that affect the way you sleep at night? I sleep like a baby every night. 
do you? <laughs> even, when, even when there's contracts out on you. Listen, I've made my peace with God. You know, I, I know I'm on borrowed time. But all that matters to me as a man of principle, as an Englishman, is that I can look at myself, I look, look myself in the eye and think, you're doing the right thing. That's all that matters. Just keep doing the right thing. Don't worry about the consequences. Because to be honest, you put it in perspective, uh, we do shoulder a lot of horrendous persecution, danger, hassle, stress, and so on. People like me, people like Tommy, even Katie. Ashley's been reported to social services by Hope Not Hate. You know, we, we all get this pressure. Who is Ashley? Uh, Ashley is the co-leader of Britain First. She actually joined Britain First five years ago when we were rebuilding after being released from prison. Uh, and she's been a, a multiple election candidate. She's the highest polling uh, nationalist political party local election candidate in this country for years on end. She's um, she in elections. She's beat the Tories. She's beat reform. She's beaten bloody everyone except Labour. She's doing. She's done really well. Um, she's now worked her way up. She's now the co-leader of Britain First, and. Uh, yeah, she's a real asset. But she she came to us, I actually bumped into her five years ago on a day of action in Manchester. She was part of a group up there called the Yellow Vests, who were copying the Yellow Vests in France at that time. They were doing their protests. I remember them. Civil disturbance. So it's like the British branch of them. And uh, we bumped into each other in St Anne's Square and we had a meeting a bit later that day and she came to the meeting and the rest is history. Okay, some, some, some random questions that you're going to think... I didn't fucking think it'd be. I didn't think I was coming here for this, but I want to know a little bit about Paul the person. Mm. What, what's your favourite meal? Favourite meal? Yeah. Bloody hell. Do you know what? I'm one of these people. I get up in the morning and I work and I work and I work and I work. These days, especially, I work and work and work. I might go to boxing and then come back and carry on working. Come 11, 12 at night, I end up going to sleep. I eat boring, plain food. I've never been, you know, Never been much interested in that. I only I only eat because otherwise I'll starve to death, and that's it. I'm not. I, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's it's like it's like having to to urinate or or go go for a number two. It's it's one of those things you have to do. But apart from that, I'm just a hundred mile an hour. Politics, 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 politics. Mm. So food for you is just fuel. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know how to answer that question because I, I'll just order microwave meals, or I've just figured out how to cook steaks and, and scrambled egg and stuff like that. So I'm starting to eat a lot more healthy these days and doing a lot more boxing and tie boxing uh, and, and getting in shape. I've lost a lot of weight compared to five years ago, six years ago. A lot. Getting really fit now. Did you put on weight because you were stressed, do you think? I think it was, I was going for a real stressful time. There, there was, um, And also just because all my life I've been training. I've either been boxing or tie boxing or training in MMA. I'm a blue blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and submission wrestling. Uh, I've always been doing some kind of combat training, always. Uh, but, uh, yeah, for a few years, I, I I just stopped doing it because Britain first started taking off and I was too busy and I just lost interest in it temporarily. So I did balloon for a bit. And then when I came out of prison in 2018, I started doing boxing again every single day, eating like a saint, boxing, boxing, boxing. And I was... I was 90% of it was gone within three months. When you're eating better, do you feel sharper? Yeah. It, 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 I, I have to. I've, I've stopped drinking. Uh, I don't, I've never smoked. I, I don't drink. I haven't drank for five years now, over five years. Was there a reason for the not drinking? It, there, there's several reasons. One, the older you get, the hangovers were starting to kill me. Mm. You, you know, you have one one Bacardi breeze and you, you're hung over for four days. It's just like, yeah, I can't keep doing this. <laughs> um, and also there was... As Britain First was getting more prominent, more well-known, I was getting recognised far more often. Gets to a point where everyone can act like an idiot when they're drunk, especially getting into fights, whether you're to blame or not. Mm. There was one in uh, Northern Ireland where I was. they tried to use this footage of me having a fight outside a nightclub in Belfast. And they said, look, look how fuggish Paul Golding is. And you can see by looking at the footage, actually I was defending myself, backing off, trying to get away from it all. Uh, and I had I had to throw one punch, and then I walked off, and that was it. And they said, "Oh, look, that's evidence of him being a thug." But you can tell by watch, watching the footage; it's, it's, it's nonsense. I've noticed that that anyone in the political arena, if they're caught on camera defending themselves, and they throw a punch and they put mm. somebody on their ass, which 
is nine times out of ten, that's what happens if you hit someone. Yeah. They're branded a thug. It's not, oh, he's retaliated or responded or defended himself. It is... He's a thug, especially it if, you're, is, yeah. especially if yeah. you're your side of politics. Yeah. Not that I'm going to go They down. always try to paint, quote, the far right as being thuggish. So, yeah, I mean, even this, I, I know this. I, I, I know this more than most people. And so, so I think maybe just Tommy, because Tommy gets attacked a lot. Uh, you have to understand that you get in a confrontation, if someone recognises you and they don't like you and they're verbal about it, You've got to con- you've got to immediately remind yourself the law is on his side. Mm. The law's against you. Tread carefully. So I resisted it, but I had to a bit, one punch, and he was on his on his backside, and I walked off. Um, and then five months later, that footage was on Panorama in Northern Ireland. So I thought, yeah, that's it. And I had about four day hangover with that, and I just thought, that's it. Lying in the sand, no more alcohol, no more drinking. Mm. Who's your favourite musician? Do you ever go to concerts? Do you ever just switch off and think, I'm going to go and watch Elton John this weekend somewhere? No. no, Not into music? Do you know what? Food, music, sports don't interest me. What are you into outside of politics? Like I say, my, my outlets at the moment, and the, the, the only outlets, literally, is uh, training. So boxing, tie boxing, um, that's it. That, that's my only outlet. Um, and when I'm relaxing or trying to relax... I've still got my phone in my hand and I'm still blah, blah, blah. but when I'm when I'm semi relaxed I'm just watching uh history programs programs about Christianity scientific programs it's just like an influx of information influx of knowledge so you sit there reading a book and and you'll forget 90, 90% of it 95% of it um or you can watch uh put YouTube on and watch a, a program about anything yeah YouTube's you know, great in it but you about Julius Caesar or Napoleon or bloody Elizabeth the First, the Spanish Armada, anything you want, you can sit there watching. That sinks into your memory a lot easier. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, if I start reading the book, my mind wanders yeah. elsewhere. Tell me some of your historical heroes oh, that hell. maybe moulded you into the man that you are. <laughs> very difficult, very difficult. Oliver Cromwell was a particular hero of mine. Um, and the Duke of Wellington and, and Admiral Nelson, these are the British titans of history on, on the timeline. Edward I, the Longshanks, Alfred the Great, Elizabeth I was, uh, you know, unbelievable. Uh, so I, I've got a comprehensive knowledge about a lot of historical, even Winston Churchill. I, I read several books about Winston Churchill when I was in the probation hostel, 2018. I opened my understanding of Winston Churchill up because we just think he's a war leader, a rabble rouser. It, not many people are aware that he's an accomplished intellectual author and that he, he, he was, you know, an incredible man in so many different ways. He, he escaped from POW camps and trekked across the African steppes and the African savannas and for hundreds of miles. He's, when you get into the nitty-gritty of all these people, you appreciate their greatness a lot more. So when I focus on history, I focus more on the people. If I was, like I say, if I was to pick up a book about the English Civil War, I'd probably quickly switch off. But I could read a book about Oliver Cromwell and devour it very quickly. It would interest me when you when you learn about people as opposed to events. But that's pretty much it. If you these days, for at least for the last five years, it's just been uh, training and history, training history. Apart from that, it's just politics. No social life, no friendship circle, just absolute obedience to the cause. Laser focus. Yeah, singular laser focus. Like I say, it's, there is no... Paul Golding these days, there is no more personal Paul Golding, non-political, but Paul Golding is a full-time, 24-7 politician, and that's it. There's no other version. Well, it's nice to know who you are, and that's what that's what you've, you've got a cause, you've got a purpose. I mean, that's great for the state of mind. A lot of people are walking around lost it's, in fact, it's very refreshing to see a man that's sat in front of me that knows exactly what he wants, where he's going, and what he's going to do. Mm. And no one can take that from you. Well, I'll tell you, what, what, what I'm saying now was, was controversial back in 1999 when I first got involved. would have been considered really extreme. You know, things like GB News even, mm. or Nigel Farage, or anything that Tommy says, or anything I say, anything Ashley says. You know, anything we say these days, back then, would have been really controversial. But now it's mainstream. Is Tommy joining Britain first? Uh, he, we've we've spoken many many times about him standing in like a, a suitable by-election, like parliamentary by-election, 
and he's up for it. He, he really likes the idea. And I think it'd be great as well. Uh, like, imagine Tommy standing against George Galloway in Rochdale. Be hilarious. For example. Mm. That's just one example. Be brilliant. Because uh, someone, like, someone like George would underestimate Tommy and come come very unstuck. Well, imagine them clashing mm. like, constantly. It'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, if, if, if Tommy wants to stand... Uh, for Britain first in by-elections or in a general election. I said to him, what about standing in the general election in Telford where you've done so much spade work, so much, so many investigations, so many marches and protests already? You've laid the groundwork in Telford. What about standing there? That's one option. Mm. We'll just see how things go. And what do you think of the royal family? Oh, this is a contentious issue. I, 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 I try to, because this is contentious, I put polls up regularly on my Twitter and so on asking our supporters, our support base, do you still support the monarchy or not? And it's always, always 50-50. So I've got to trade carefully here because I could easily upset half of the Britain First support base. My personal opinion, which I think is is, is pretty pretty uh, down the middle, uh, and this is not false in any way, this is my opinion, is that the idea, the concept, the institution of a monarchy, I support 100%. I just, <clears throat> I just think there's a lot to be desired of the House of Windsor. And do you believe that Prince Andrew doesn't sweat? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I think he's just a, a, a typical privileged elitist creature, isn't he? He's been caught red-handed. You know, he's settled out of court and he's now claiming he was forced to settle out. Who, who settles out of court if you've not got anything to hide? You don't, do you? £12 million, pound, wasn't it? Yep. To the tune of? Yep. Lady Victoria Hervey has just been on a podcast saying that she thinks Prince Andrew is innocent, that the picture with him, mm. with his arm around the waist was fake and it's all soon to be, it's all going to be out there soon and people are going to be very embarrassed in how they've responded to that interview with Prince Andrew, whereas I can't see that. Do you know what though? We've got to bear this in mind. We've got to bear this in mind. We we live under English common law, so it's innocent until proven guilty. I don't think he's, let's say he's innocent, mm -hmm. yeah? Let's pretend he's innocent, hypothetically. Why did he settle out of court? It's, it, it, that for me... There's no other way of looking at reading into that, is there? That he's admitting his guilt and he's trying to get it off his back? I'll tell you what it was for me. The fact that he could have picked up a phone and gone, Jeffrey, you're a convicted people. Oh, I want nothing more to do with you. Goodbye. End of story. But he didn't. He got on a plane. He flew out to the States and spent four days with him walking around Central Park and spending it in his house. And that's where he slept. Yeah. One of the richest men on the planet and it was convenient to stay at Jeffrey Epstein's house rather than get a hotel, a yeah. five-star hotel. Madness. I mean, yeah. I, Who does that? I, I've been falsely accused of things before that have been that have been investigated and then dropped by the police, you know, because it's obvious nonsense. You know, when you're... Look at Trump. He's been accused 27 times of sexual assault. You know, he's been he's been found liable for, for sexual assault and sexual molestation, all this by, by corrupt, politically motivated courts. So it, it has to be innocent until proven guilty. Look at the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard fiasco. It turns out like that she had six years in the sunshine where she was pretending to be the victim. It turns out that she, she was actually the abuser. And it was Johnny Depp that was the one who was, you know, being abused. It's amazing. But everyone seems at the moment, you, to, it's like, almost like the, the process is the punishment. So you get the false accusation, mm. uh, you get dragged over the coals. It doesn't matter if it goes away or gets proven. You've already been through the bad times because of it. Mm. And there's no there's no repercussions for, for these false accusations and so on. Um, so I've been through that a lot. We could talk about that on, a, on another podcast because there's so much going on on that front. You know, we're always being subject to dirty tricks on this side of the fence. I've tried to delve deeper into the into Paul the person. I know that you're full blown uh, politician mode, and I sort of sense there was. I've sensed during this interview that there's there's something that you're holding back. And every time I've sort of gone to dig into your private life, there's been a resistance for whatever reason. 
And what you've just said there, we, there could be a part two because there's things going on in the background. Have I half called that right? And is is there going to be room for part two? You're half right, but that what, what I meant was part two could be there's, you see, there's stuff that's like overt stuff that goes on. Police arrests, police prosecutions, prison stints. There's also mountains of dirty tricks going on behind the scenes and you have to wait for them to be resolved before you can speak about them. So as soon as these these uh, issues, that the, particularly the current saga that's playing out at the moment, and is is the current saga with Paul the politician or Paul the person, both in a way, yeah, both in a way. Okay, uh, but like I say, I can't mention it at the moment because it's unresolved. As soon as it's resolved, I'll be happy to to, to spend hours. I, I've got dozens of recordings, videos, screenshots, some of the stuff. People only see, you know, the, the outward projection. Like they see a politician, they see a leafleting session, they see a battle bus driving around. T- they don't understand what goes on behind the scenes when we're attacked and subverted and falsely accused behind the scenes and you can't talk about it. Uh, that's some of the work. Like you have betrayals, you have hope not hate paying people to tell lies about you. Those types of issues... Uh, are probably the ones that cause the most stress. No, because I don't care if the police arrest me, the police prosecute me, put me in prison. I don't give, really give a shit. Um, the stuff that really causes stress is the dirty tricks and the betrayals. You know, who who do you trust? I've, been, I've had my fingers burned so many bloody times. Can I ask you this? Even coming here today to be interviewed by me, is there an element of can I trust this person? Am I walking into the lion's den? Are you like that with with everyone and everything because of what you've experienced? We're getting media inquiries all the time. And it's at the point now where I just tell them to piss off. You know, it's sort of like the BBC, the ITV and all that, which piss off, we're not interested. Um, so I know, I've seen your podcasts. I know that you'll be fair and reasonable. So I, I, I don't mind coming down here and spending time with you. I, 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 you know, I've got nothing to hide but I'm not going to waste my time doing this with someone from the BBC Mm. because they they will quite happily use deception and falsehoods and lies and poison. They'll happily do that deliberately. Mm. You know, I I wouldn't give someone like that my time, but I've seen your podcasts and I've seen the way you deal with people and I think, yeah, if if he wants wants money show, that's not a problem. And can you see yourself doing more of these? Of course, yeah. I say, I've, in 25 years, I've only done two of these, one with Tommy Robinson and this one now. Because most of the rest of the time, it's it's just like, you know, foot to the floor, meetings, activities, protests, whatever it is, just mm. full-on activities and activism and so on, full-time politics. Because I think this is the way forward for for people that have been subjected to God knows what by the mainstream media. Absolutely, Yeah. Like I say, it's, it's more a matter of what have I been focusing on in previous years? And it's I've been more focusing on activism, organisation, meetings, polit- election campaigns. It's just been full on politics. It's very rare that I've sat down and thought, right, well, this this guy's... I've, I've turned down a lot of invites before. I've turned them down because I thought, I just... I haven't got the time. I'd rather... Like tomorrow... I've got to go home now. I've got to organise. We've got two days of action tomorrow. Mm. One in the Midlands, one in South East London. And it, they're quite complex because you've got to make sure you've got everything from the banners, the leaflets, the, the battle bus is fueled up. Uh, you've got to send out the text message alerts to tell people where to meet, what time. You've got to make sure there's security. Well, our own security officers are going to be there to keep everyone safe. So it's like full on mm. organising stuff 24 7. And how have you found this? You enjoyed it? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. I enjoyed my one with Tommy. And it's it's nice to sit down and talk and articulate um, what I've been through. And like I say, it's very difficult in, in, in a few hours to articulate. I've, I've written my book, The Battle for Britain. You, I think you said you've read it recently. Uh, you know, that book goes into forensic detail. And what we've spoken about now is kind of, you know, just scratching the surface and just just, just touching upon things. But if, if people out there buy my book and sit down and read it forensically, by the end of it, they'll be horrified. And that book finishes five years ago, so it needs an update. Hmm. These are the last five years. In the last five years, I've been ambushed, prosecuted, all sorts of mad stuff. And that book will appear on the screen now? 
And where can people buy your book? Just on the Britain First website. Yeah. Okay, so we'll put that that link in the description as well. And what about social media? Where can people find you there? Well, thanks to Elon Musk, we're back on X or Twitter, so people can find us there. Paul Golding account, Britain First, Ashley Simon, any of those. And what would be your final message for anyone that you feel has maybe misunderstood you or your political party or your movement or your organisation over the span of the time that you've been involved and at, you know, top of the tree, what would you say to them? Uh, we've lost critical thinking. And so people just, people jump to assumptions all the time. They don't look, they don't test, they don't scrutinise, they don't compare. You know, critical thinking is absolutely necessary. So when you hear all the accusations under the sun, check it out. When you check it out, you'll find out that most of the, the vast majority of the time, it's just bullshit. And uh, it's being peddled by our enemies to try and blacken our name because of they don't like our political positions. They don't like our political beliefs. So, you know, if you've if anyone's watching this, you think, oh, well, you're Paul Golding, instantly, they immediately think, they hear the name Paul Golding and it's far-right extremist. He's a bit extreme. Really? Read my book. Watch videos that we've put up there. Go onto the Britain First website and just ask yourself after that, is this really extreme? Because I think you'll say, no, it isn't. And the other thing I wanted to say is, get up off of your backside and get involved. It doesn't matter whether it's with Britain First, with Tommy or anything else. This country is f on its last legs now. We're in the last chance saloon. We are going to be a minority, an ethnic minority in our own country in 20, 25 years. If, if you want a future in this country, if you want your children to have a future, you've got to take action now. This is the whole point of Britain First. It's there as a platform for people to get involved so they can take part in our democratic process and do something to fight these politicians in Westminster who are quite happy for us to lose our country. So people need now to make a decision. You've got to get involved. You've got to do something. I don't care what it is. Just come out leafleting once a year if that's all you can do, but do something. Stop being inactive because inactivity and apathy, that's what's killing our country. That's what's destroying our country. If everyone who thought like us in their heads got involved tomorrow, we would be able to turn this country around in 10 years easily. But it's that holding back that cripples any honest attempt to turn the situation around and salvage a future for our children. Paul? I appreciate you coming down and thank you for sharing your time with me because I know you're busy and I hope this changes the perception for the people watching this because you're a very different guy face-to-face -face than you are in the tabloids. Mm. 